Today, folks, we have a full docket. We've got we've got some stuff to get through. I've got tabs on tabs. So what I'm hoping to do today is just kind of go through a relatively detailed path with a whole bunch of visuals um, of how these planets have gotten better over the last 10 years. And then at the very end, we're actually going to look at the true future of the planets, where they're headed, what the plans are, and they're they're pretty interesting. Some of it is what people might call AI, um, machine learning applications to get this stuff to work on a larger scale with more recognizable large terrain features. So that's just to kind of give you an, a, a preview of what we're doing today. Starting with this first video in 2015, showing us off actually kind of a pre-visualization of what they wanted to do with Nix, um, with the Levski landing zone. Many people don't know about this, but, oh, <laughs> many people don't know about this, but Levski and Delamar itself from the Nix system were the first place that we could land in the game. And for a long time, we would basically be in the Crusader planetary system, or you could jump over to Delamar, which was kind of a distance away. Then it got removed. It got removed with Microtech somewhere around here, I believe. Like uh, around here, yeah. So around this period of time, in 2020, 2021, Nix, the, the, the Levski area, Delamar, it got removed to the Nix system. But we do know that what you're about to see here represents a landing zone that has basically already been created, just has to be updated. Which is why most people will tell you the third star system we're getting which probably isn't following too closely or too far behind Pyro is Nyx. Don't listen to those people who, who insinuate that these star systems will take 10 years each. It's insane. But here is the first look we got at what they wanted to do with Planet Tech. Um, and this will kind of set the stage for our development going forward. Thanks again for coming. Hope you enjoy. You can kind of tell they're not actually flying here. So that's that was mainly a a preview. Uh, that's honestly landing zone kind of stuff. That's not even really planet tech. Um, but I wanted to give you that as sort of the that was a standard that they were trying to aim for back then. And again, this was before we even saw all of the stuff they could do. The next thing we see, actually, you know what? Let me pull up another video first. Uh, be twenty sixteen. Gamescom, I think it was. Yeah. So here was the first time we ever actually saw them land on a planet. And you get to see the... This is like the first time we got a full showcase of a, a planet, of procedural tech, of 
all that kind of stuff. And you're going to hear it from the crowd just how Welcome hyped right it was we'll, when this happened. We'll, uh, and yeah, if we pull out a little, sorry, pull out a little bit, uh, Chris. So, and then Microtech is where you'll see Hurston. So uh, this is what I was Crusader, talking about. Delamar was right here. Sort of Crusader was right here. Del Delamar, which and is, uh, you just have to make that short jump over there in order to, you know, see this different landing zone from all the other places on the Crusader moons. This is the upper orbit station uh, outside uh, Delamar, which, which is a uh, sort of rocky, small planetoid. Uh, and Levski aboard it is, a, well, originally it was an ab abandoned mining uh, town uh, facility, and it was sort of taken over by uh, the People's Alliance, which were a, a group of sort of uh, anti-UEE uh, kind of uh, polit political activists during the Messer area. Um, and so since then, it's sort of evolved into a, a place free from sort of the, the boot of the UE. So he so mentioned here, if you kind of Delamar is actually an asteroid, technically. It's like a really, really big asteroid that's round and looks kind of like a moon, but it's pretty small. But something to keep in mind with this game, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong here, because I know I always get them backwards. The scale of planets in this game is made to look big, but not be so big that it feels daunting to fly around them, you know? So they made all the distances, I believe they're one-tenth of the normal astronomical distances you'd expect. So moons are closer to planets, everything's closer to the star, things look bigger in the sky. Planets themselves, though, are one-sixth scale, so they actually are a little bit bigger. Um, and everything looks a little bit bigger. But this throws people off because, you know, the cities look big from orbit. Some people don't like this. And it, it it can be a little bit jarring when you look at orbit and you can, like, see planets looking really big. So the scale, the scaling of distances and planets, while it's different, was picked specifically to kind of enhance the experience. And I'm not, you know, I, I don't know... Um, Give or take, yeah, it's, everybody's got their own opinion on it. Is it one-tenth for the planets? So then is it one-sixth distances? I know they, it's one ratio for one and one for the other. I don't remember exactly how it is. But anyways, back to the, uh, the action. down into the atmosphere and switches to a more atmospheric flight model so there is drag there is some uh one sixth and one eighth of sort of lift uh sort of aerodynamic modeling so if you have a ship like the gladius you'll fly better than something like the aurora um so here we are at anywhere on uh del mar we could land get out and walk uh so as we fly down here perhaps uh chris we could demonstrate and just land and get out somewhere wherever you want um, there was so little detail back then. This is 2016, by the way. Hey, Jared, you want to go back to the front view for me? Yeah, perfect. Picture, yep, there we go. So there you are, Glenn's opening up the back. Chris is bringing us down. And then let's go to uh, uh, Glenn's view, Jared. That's perfect. There we go, there we go, beauty. And like, put out. They're about to lose it.
the hype was so real. These cit these citizen cons, like the 2016 through 2018 citizen cons, the messaging was not good. The expectations they set were not good. <laughs> but the demos that we got to see um, were were like so much more groundbreaking, I guess, than they are now. Like landing on a planet for the first time was was really a moment, and I think it only took. It actually took a, like a year and a half from this for us to be able to do it. So, you know, same old, same old. But this was the first landing on a planetary surface. At least that the public got to see. The, the giant worm, yeah. And, and they were still dealing with problems that we have now. Look at that. All right, who else is going to be a challenge? See, we did land everywhere. Let's see if we get, can you jump up? I don't know if we'll be able to do it. Let's see. Jump. Uh, uh, jump. Uh, it's going to glitch right, into okay. the ship and blow up. This is going to have to uh, land somewhere we can. <laughs> move a little. All right. So that was 2016, our first landing. But from there, they really started to hit a stride in terms of actually keeping us updated on how this stuff was going. So this is a look at how planetary tech development was going at that time and what they were kind of planning and doing. I don't want to make this like a three hour, four hour show. So I will kind of skip around these videos because they are pretty, they, they get fairly long. Um, but I want to give you guys a look at kind of what their ideas were back then and how they were talking about this stuff because it really does change over the next several years. Hello, uh, Marco Corbetta. I'm Senior Technical Director at Foundry 42 Frankfurt. We're going to talk about planets today. So what we're going to look at here today is the planet tech and some of the features we're going to include into our first 3.0 release. The planet tech is exactly the same tech which we have been using for moons, planets, Delamar, the Delamar planetoid, Lesky, and so on. This planet is unique. It has its own gravity, ecosystems, objects, weather, and atmosphere. If you look at the footage here, the progress we made since we started working on this, you can see- Mihai Zoris, good to see you. And you can Thank you for the sub as well. Appreciate you. 14 months, not me, mister, at 21 months. Thank you guys both for the support. You can land anywhere. You're the greatest toes. The and basically, the only way to do this is to generate the planet's surface as you are approaching it. The terrain is getting generated, recursively subdivided. Objects are procedurally scattered on the surface as they, as they are becoming visible, as well as particles, ground eaters, and so on. And when you are on the surface, you are able to see objects like space stations, moons, and so on, orbiting around the planet in space. See, I'm still waiting for something like that. Like for, I know this is, this is more of like a, not a thing that happens, but I can't wait until we see planetary bodies this close to each other. That'd be really cool. And I think the best you can get to this is like, Stanton looks really big from Hurston, but I want to see a moon super close. Just looks cool. Or maybe a, a planet close to a moon, I guess. Unloading whale, good to see you. That's true. Crusader does look kind of like that. You're right. For our, our entering the atmosphere and getting closer to a planet, in order to make sure that it looks good on all levels, um, from high up to, to the ground, we have different artist-driven input on each level. 
So on a global scale, we have our, like, our color map that defines the colors of the planet. And then when you get closer, we have our ecosystems that is um, defining our, our features. These all like fade into each other and, and become one thing. So the closer you get, the more it fades towards like the final result on the ground. We can also transition from a solar system down to a planet's surface. Here we're showing the scale we're dealing with. You can see the different level of zooming from a solar system down to the, to the different moons and planets. Uh, it's very challenging to deal with generating all these different type of environments at all these different scales. It's a lot of lines. We have a fixed pool of geometry shared for all planet and a fixed pool uh, of memory used for text to streaming. And since you can land anywhere, as mentioned before, the only solution is to proceed to generate on demand the planet surface. These shots, the geometry is I remember back when these shots were shown, shown people were going crazy about the idea of like a jungle planet. Generated on the fly. They have said things about orbits. We're gonna actually touch on that today. Orbits, seasons on planets. We'll talk about, Tom, your question, or sorry, uh, sp sp Spicker. We'll talk about your question about how they're going to start making planets faster. That's all included in this. So no worries. Stick around. And if you can't, this will be up on the second channel at some point. Textures are procedurally combined at runtime, blending many layers. This allows seamless transition from space to planet. The source data used for generation is very small. For example, on these moons, we are using only about five unique ecosystems for each planet. Each ecosystem has different properties and we are all combined with other layers and noise combinations to generate you can, a large amount of variations. You can really tell here that like it's really all about just the, the tech. The art assets are probably whatever was included in CryEngine that they carried over because it just doesn't look great. But they, this is, this is very clearly all about just making this stuff work together. This is super early. Good results when you're close to the surface. The biggest challenge, I think, with what we've been working on lately is the scattering of all these objects on the terrain. From yes, the there's too many rocks. We, made, uh, we have done a lot of progress on the terrain and the textures. We could render all these big mountains and oceans and all this type of stuff. But in the end, the planets were still empty. There was no content, there were no objects, no rocks, no trees and all that. We had a very basic system, but that didn't really work for what we wanted to achieve. So most of the R&D time that we uh, had in the last uh, couple of months went into, into this object scattering system. And the difficulty with the object scattering is um, to get a natural look. When you traditionally, you make a, you make a level for a game and you, have, uh, you can place your rocks anywhere you like or your trees and you can compose the scene where the player comes in and it looks, you have this nice vista and these background assets and all this type of stuff. So, so all of this is kind of Planet Tech V1, they were calling it, Shapes. which was very much focused on just making sure that they could make biomes, get them to wrap around a planet um, and get them to work in the 64-bit environment and make it interactable by us. You can see that they have a lot of these sort of node structures to help identify patterns and scattering and all of that. This is something we'll see repeated throughout the development process as they go between the different versions of Planet Tech. Um, they will ultimately reach Planet Tech V4, which is kind of like their final version. That was the version that they wanted to launch Planet Tech with, supposedly, but um, not, not where they wanted to stop, which again, we'll get to that soon. We're gonna talk a little bit about today, Planet Tech V5, which I think we should be expecting by the end of this year or maybe early next year and what that will include as well, which will be some of its own unique stuff. Includes the materials that define the look of the ground when you are walking around in first person. We built the rocks and the assets and the shrubs and the plants. We basically built all these components and it's, it's remixed in our procedural planet tech. Besides reusing and uh, remixing our, our textures and materials, we also built uh, built them in a smart way. When we build a material for our rocks, for example, we also use the same material in our ground textures to define how the small rocks on the ground look. In order to do this, we use Substance Designer, which really allows us to break down all our texturing uh, components into separate modules, which we can then like plug in and remix and change the settings on the fly. So this really allows us to uh, speed up our texture creation process. Textures. Here's a little demo of a landing. 
machines. So we need to do a bunch of operations on CPU side to make sure it all works on the dedicated server as well. Usually dedicated servers don't have a graphics card. So uh, currently all terrain generation is done on CPU and most of the visual textures blending is done on GPU on the client. Generation results are cached in the fixed, in the fixed geometry pool mentioned before and the generation is distributed over all available meshing cores. So the generation is very efficient and is scaling with the number of available cores. The generation results are exactly the same on client and server, so there is no need to transmit any information to replicate the environment. Here we're watching a video. That actually, that landing just reminded me, there was a period of time where the, the landing gear on all the ships didn't have shocks or dampers and so they would it would just be like landing on stiff stilts the the ship would just bounce on the ground when you landed it was so ugly and we were clamoring for like a smoother landing option for such a long time just remind you of like all the little things that this game used to have going on with it here is a, a really really good video that they showed showing off planet tech this was like a super popular clip for a long time because it was just beautiful thanks for watching I think this is also before we got the reclaimer, so nice little teaser. Hey, you guys want to experience a really fun effect? If you focus on the reclaimer for the whole time it's pulling out there, once once you get pretty high up in the space, look at something else in your area, like text or something else, and it'll all start bulging out towards you. It's really weird. Try it. Just keep watching the reclaimer. All right, now look at something else. And it should do some weird stuff to your eyeballs. You know, eyeball things. All right. So moving on from the, actually somebody wanted to see the, uh, the 2016 Citizen Con demo. I'll show you that real quick. This was their kind of, this is their follow up to that first demo we watched, this landing. This is just a few months later, but they, it showed some really good work on the Planet Tech showing off the Lear system, which we've covered a couple times in the last few. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I told you guys this was Planet Tech V1. Apparently they were already on V2 at this point. She's looking at different place time, basically different ways to generate the tech. And uh, it introduced, I think, weather systems as well. So here's a little look at that.
definitely more biome stuff going on. Looks a little bit more natural than what we saw with Delamar. Obviously, since Delamar is just a rock. Nice Dune reference. This is the Lear system. This is pretty far away from Stanton, but we'll see planets like this in the future, no doubt. Close to when you first backed. This is really close to when I started paying attention to the game more. I think I started following Star Citizen very closely, probably maybe five to six months after this video came out. And I watched this video a lot. There are actually a couple things in this demo that still aren't in Planet Tech. I think there are things that we might see in Planet Tech V5. Weather, uh, flight restrictions, and really big animals. Sandworm, you know. I missed it. <laughs> I'm sorry, can we just, can, can I go on a little tangent here real quick? Okay, this is really funny because Chris, Chris Roberts used to do this every single year. Every year there would be a CitizenCon demo and every year there would be some kind of a flyby during that demo and every single time that flyby would happen, people would be clapping because they appreciate what's going on. And every time people were clapping, Chris would be like, ah, you guys, you missed it. <laughs> this is where it happened before. Let's see if I can find that. Right here. Look at this. He does it again. He does it every year. And they'd like stage it and everything. Okay, he didn't say you missed it there, actually. <laughs> but he still calls it out. <laughs> oh, and I'm pretty sure we got it the next year, too. It's really funny to me. Chris is such a character. Okay, so I didn't want to spend too much time on this one. Just wanted to give you a little look at it. Here is that like uh, flight restriction stuff that I talked about that's still not in the game. In this particular case, uh, this planet. Um, so we're heading towards it. So I think uh, this is telling us the atmospheric conditions are unsafe. And one of the one of the key gameplay things you want to do on, because obviously the planetary tech is going to allow us to have a whole bunch of uh, play areas we don't normally have, is to encourage players not to always, you know, maybe you can't always fly there. Maybe you have to get out and use your rover, for instance, because you have a new color. So let's find, let's go find a landing zone that's on the edge of the the desert plane. And if there's something I've learned about Chris, it's that even if he's saying something that doesn't seem like it's going to happen. What just happened? My monitor just turned off. <laughs> what the heck? Why? What is wrong with you? I got this new monitor recently and it is... It's off and on. If you, if you watch all of the demos that they do, Chris says some things and you're like, Chris... Why are you saying that? That doesn't so, sound like it's going to happen. And then years later, it happens. Check this out. This is... Uh... Actually, I'm the wrong one. I, it's actually from the demo that we were just watching, I think. The, uh... This one. Yeah. See this one? Yep. Check this out. Listen to what he says here. This was 2017. Remember that. Because we're going to get to the point where they introduce the very thing he says here to planets. And uh, it's like, really? You guys actually went and did that? Come on, YouTube, don't make this awkward. All right, here we go, listening. Yeah, yeah so, uh, you know, the, 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 the yeah, German engine team that does all the procedural planet stuff is 
uh, been adding obviously a lot of stuff to the procedural planet tech. Um, the oceans have all been ported over to GPU and ultimately we're not doing it here, but um, you know, there, there actually has, if we get low enough, you'll probably see there's it's full wave uh, simulation. When we get low enough, we want to have the thing where the wake from the ship creates waves. Not, that's not in yet, but we will be doing that at some point. And you're like, okay, Chris, at some point, you get five years later, and you're like, hey, dude, you said that you were going to be doing that at some point, and then we get to here in 2023. And it's like, oh, you're Both doing it now. Surface foam, first of all. Uh, next, we have this last bit that I want to talk about. This has been If I can find it. We're supposed to just show it off. It's dramatic difference. Um, the absolute pleasure to work on. So we had a few aims for this. We wanted it to be multi-input. We want physical. There we go. Find us there. Took him six years. Six years. But when Chris says he wants to do something, I guess they find a way to do it. Anyways, here is some more talk. Let's see, where were we? Here. So this is another update on procedural planet tech. Uh, what was going on with moons and planets at this point. So by now, by 2018, we were, we had just received Hurston. Um, so we were landing on planets, landing on moons, and we were understanding kind of how it worked. But the next planet they were talking about was Arcorp. And everybody's like, how the heck are you going to do a planet that is a whole city? Like this was crazy at the time. Flying to Arcorp now is not really a novel thing. But back then, it was like, how the heck are you going to make a whole city like this? And these are the first kind of looks we got at that sort of development as they were continuing to push forward with their planet tech. Much they look better now. Yeah, much higher resolution than the work in progress stuff that was shown uh, previously. Now, looking ahead to early next year, we're going to continue our tour of uh, the Stanton system and go to our court. So here we can see some uh, white box R&D that's been done by Ian Leland, who's the art director of Star Citizen on uh, city block biomes for the planet itself, because uh, yeah, our corp is almost entirely covered by man-made structures. So we've been looking at how we can use our newer planet tech, which has improved from last year, and sort of have uh, the kind of more man-made and manufactured biomes, as opposed to the sort of organic ones that you've sort of seen around Hurston. We're really looking at trying to get a much better sense of scale and also variety and detail in the buildings and you can just really look out and see a whole skyline and you also have a variety of hats. So as you see in this video, you can see from sort of far distance coming down, you can see, you know, for a huge distance, um, you know, the sort of small outer area suburbs around Area 18, these huge buildings that you can fly in, there's like Art Corp Tower, uh, and there's a just really great sense of uh, scale. And it's significantly more impressive than, than what we were showing when we showed the Arcorp prototype last year. So I, I think by the time we release it uh, for you guys to fly around with, it's going to be a really cool experience. Um, so we're pretty excited by uh, how it just gets better. Yes, very cool. And here we see further visual work on the icy moon of Lyria. We'll come back to Arcorp's moons in a little bit here. They actually talk a little more about how they get more efficient making these planets and moons very, in that episode. Very cool. Um, all right, so carrying on our tour, we're leaving Art Corp now. We are going uh, a, little few, a little further in the timeline of our development of, of uh, next year in Star Citizen. Uh, but here is uh, Microtech. We're looking at a biome that the art team's working on. So we're doing exploration on Microtech. So it is the coldest of planets in the Stanton system. Uh, you know, so we have a Microtech, Art Corp, Crusader and Hurston, but Microtech uh, had a terraforming accident, so it's a little colder than the other ones, uh, but it's not completely covered in snow and ice. So we're also looking at other areas that would be sort of like Nordic forest land or that kind of stuff. Uh, so this is some exploration that the art team's been doing, and you, know, you, you can see here a very different feel than say the savannah of Hurston. And so it's cool, and as we start to flesh out these biomes, on uh, you know planets like Microtech or uh, future ones that we do, uh, just you can sort of see the potential of the variety and the beauty that will be in this. So. Yes. A lot of us have already point. landed on Microtech at this point, and we can see how it compares to what they just showed. Um, but that's a little check-in. 2018, they're moving along. I would say I think it was Planetech V3 maybe. Here is the update on Arcorp's moons I was talking about. This kind of gives you an idea. 
they'll occasionally give you some updates on how easy it is for them to make this stuff and they made a lot of progress between these different planets. The Arcorp moons were our first moons where it felt like we really figured out our workflow. It was actually quite interesting because the tools didn't change anymore. We didn't do any bigger changes to, to our planet editor anymore and that's why we had a much better idea of how long it would take to create one of these moons. Our goal is to fill an entire universe with these entities, which takes a lot of time. And they were kind of a test case to see how fast are we really at making these things. And you have to be able to create this look in a procedural way. So you need a lot of parameters that you have to be able to control and then output many, many assets uh, really fast. Ultimately, we will use these findings to shorten the production time of all planets and moons in the future. Walla was done in a fairly short amount of time. It took us around four weeks. Uh, so we used very procedural workflows for everything that we needed for the moon. We tried to repurpose a lot of assets that we already had. Keep that in mind, four weeks for one moon. Had tried to give them a fresh look. And one thing that's very special about Walla is these um, minerals or crystals. These minerals are basically what's going to drive this planet. Um, it's the only thing that brings color to the planet and uh, the material itself looks very interesting compared to everything else. After we did our first iteration with a procedural tool, we decided to do more of manual work on them. So for example, the crystals were made with a tool called ZBrush. Very manual work, so you start off with a very primitive shape and it's basically a lot like clay modeling, but on the computer. And this process usually takes a lot longer because uh, everything has to be done by hand. So then you have one crystal and of course you need variations of these crystals. So of course uh, we always try to be as time efficient as possible. But if we feel it is worth it, we are more than willing to put in this extra time and make sure that we really polish this part of the universe. Lyria, in comparison to Walla, features a bit more variety in terms of content, so that's why it took a bit longer. It was something around four to five weeks. Landscape-wise, it features everything from mountains to flatlands. Those consist of dark rocks, dark volcanic rock, and um, larger frozen areas. Ice is an element that is also quite dominant on Lyria. The player, while exploring Lyria, will encounter a lot of frozen, shallow water places. But one element that was supposed to make Lyria stand out is the uh, uh, cryo-geysers. So, you know, what a geyser is, is basically just water piercing through the terrain, right? Like almost a fountain. But as Lyria is supposed to be a very cold, very, very unpleasant um, place, and those geysers basically froze when, when they pierced through the earth. So this is, this is an element that will be found um, all over Lyria. Well, that just about does it for us this <laughs> week, right, Steve Sean? Bender. I guess we actually just saw him in the CitizenCon update. I feel like we haven't seen him much besides last year's CitizenCon. Um, so that's a look at our corpse moons. Basically, they were updating their planet tech with every couple of planets. So from Ar from Hurston, they went to Arcorp. From Arcorp, they went to Microtech. From Microtech, they went to Crusader. And we'll see all of those updates here as they continue on. This was an interesting talk as this was kind of just focused on just talking. There weren't as many visuals here, but they do get, I think, into the visuals of the stuff they were making. There's an important line here, though, that talks a little bit about where they're headed. This is 2019, so they're starting to work towards Planet Tech V4, which was what they wanted to actually launch with. Again, when I say launch, I don't mean the game. I mean more so that they just had a level of fidelity they wanted planets to meet. Um, that was like their baseline, and then from there they would keep continue to work on, which is what we've been seeing over the last few years. But here is the, the talk they were having and just kind of a little discussion about Planet Tech at that time again. Uh, late 2019 now. Um, <coughs> uh, one of the questions from the thread had to do with, in a lot of the images that folks have seen 
uh, so far, uh, either uh, at CitizenCon or, or the folks that are in Ibukati, uh there seems to be, there, there is occasionally an issue with repeated textures, with repeated textures in some cases. Uh, is this something that, was it, was it a V3 thing? Is it something that's been mitigated in V4? Is it something unrelated? Is it something that's still outstanding? What can you tell us about it? Um, the repeated textures are obviously an issue. Um, they have been, at least from my personal opinion, better in V3. But um, that being said, um, V4 is still very much in a, in a groundwork phase almost. I mean, it's it's pretty good already, but it's like the foundation of things to come. Um, and uh, the fact that the textures are tiling so much is like a compounded issue com uh, coming from technical issues about precision um then we have to go into like the, the 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 way we apply textures to the terrain is very manual right now which we definitely want to improve in the future with more procedural or like procedural things to help the artists do a quicker better job at this mm -hmm. and then there's also the issue that we're still like i'm not sure if i should say this but we've added tech to v4 the last two weeks so uh it's still an ongoing thing uh mm -hmm. and we will d there definitely plans to improve this from a purely technical uh, procedural approach as well without any artist input so it's it's not something we're gonna fix in free eight but it's uh, definitely on the list to of things to do uh, hopefully very shortly you make a good point there about how we we've, we're still adding to to the to everything that makes up Planetech v4 even in the last couple weeks um things are very rarely ever like done like okay that's it that's the last we're going to do on something and then we never we never go back to it if it, it's a it's a hallmark of star citizens development that if there's a if, if there's a fix to be made if there's an improvement uh to be included uh we will pursue that uh the next question is actually related to this is v4 considered final which i kind of i think i just answered or, was, or will there be a v5 a v6 a v7 in the future um well, I wouldn't say it's final. I think um, there's a foundation now that we can continue to build on, and it's it's one that we put a lot of effort into thinking through and uh, made, make sure that it is something that we can uh, could continue to build on. Um, I don't think there are changes that would be that would warrant a rename to V5 um, because I think everything that goes on top of this. Um, is is the iteration on on what in in essence is what we have now? Well, um, if that makes sense, like, things may have changed a bit, from my point of view at least. I you know that's totally fair, and uh, I think a very solid, a valid point. Um, yeah, we just like I say, uh, it's it's good in all aspects. I'd say some better than V three, some still a bit behind. Um, but we have plans for everything to improve them. Um, if we get when and. How are we going to get around to do that? Um, we'll see. But nothing should warrant a complete rework or like, uh, yeah. yeah, a major number change, I guess. We're, we're, we're never going to say never. Let's, let's put it that way. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't want to sit here and say, oh, there's, there's, I guess there's never going to be a Planet Tech V5. Take that to the bank. That's not, right. what, that's not what we're saying here. It's just that uh, with V4, we believe we've got a foundation that's pretty solid that we can continue to build on. And we're hopeful that this gets us to where we need to go and will continue to support us for all the time to follow. So this is, again, this is late 2019 that they are talking about this. Uh, let's jump forward a little bit and see what they're talking about here. Well, we've got Hurston. This is the Planetech V4 version of Hurston. I think if yes. they wanted fans to make this stuff, that would have been essentially mean they'd have to put they'd have to put the game engine in players' hands, which is probably the most valuable thing this company owns. I don't think they'd be willing to let players have access to their game engine. Um, but ultimately, this is just like a lot of the other stuff they've been developing over the last seven years. It's not even, it's not even in a place where they can, I think they, they, they feel like it's a final tool, you know? A lot of what they've been doing here, a lot of what we'll see in like, where is it? in this video is just explaining how the game engine itself works. So I don't know, I don't think they would really get enough out of handing this stuff over to people. Modeling stuff? Yeah, maybe, I don't know. Uh, this is from Monday. So, uh, As in you did uh, this work Monday? 
Um, so yeah, this is this is uh, uh, close to to uh, to what what will be going out soon. Um, as you might notice, uh, we we took this opportunity to go a little bit back to the 2017 version of Hurston that we presented. So everything is a bit more darker and polluted. Uh, we wanted to we wanted to take this opportunity just to go back to the original art direction a bit more. Hmm. That's unfortunate. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> saw that. Nobody saw that. No. Um, but yeah, all the elements are coming together again, and uh, yeah, we're so things are looking a lot better than they did a couple of years prior so far. But man, and there's so many rocks everywhere. Um, with, with V4, it's 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 really about a, a new and solid foundation that we can continue to build on, right. uh, versus having what you have and try to like hook things into it to make exceptions for. Uh, now we want to be able to do this. Uh, this is a, from the ground up, and. Um, I think that that was the most important thing for for us as the uh, like the team um, that we wanted to have something that we know in the foundation is co is correct and we can actually continue to build on moving forward. Now, will this run on my uh, a forty six or do I have to upgrade to a Pentium? It's not really <laughs> just more. <laughs> <Okay. Don't>, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, all of these planets are very basic that they're showing us first. All these demos are like very simple versions of planets. And as we get further and further on towards the pyro section, you'll start to see just how much they expand on all this. Here is a, a talk at 2019. This is the, towards the end of 2019. So about a year later, I believe. No, I'm sorry. This is around the same time. Oh, this is a, what? Okay, this was uploaded on the same day, but this is from CitizenCon, whereas this is a Star Citizen Live. So I think this is where they kind of talk a little bit more in depth about what the heck this new planet tech is and why they're calling it V4 and what they're actually working towards. Oh, I remember this demo. Yeah, I remember this. Okay, this will be an interesting watch. Uh, let me get the volume for you guys. We'll talk about the difference between V3 and V4. Think only one layer. So what would be the next steps after version three? We had the desire for something quicker to generate with less uh, direct artistic control like we had previously in V2, but still being able to influence terrain shape and colors like in V3. We want a smaller ecosystem to get more details improve blending and transitions. But still, we need to take into account special planets like our core. So, enter planets V4, our final version. We decided to go for a more physically-based approach. We wanted to improve on ecosystems blending and transitions. And now I'm handing over to Michel to give us an overview of V4. Thank you, Marco. Um, I hope this clicker holds up, because uh, there seems to be some interference. So, um, like I said, I'm the lead artist on the organics team. Um, our team works with the, the planet tech tool day in, day out. Uh, all the planets you've seen so far have been created uh, by the team in DE. Um, so we had some uh, thoughts and demands when, whenever we talk about tools and what we want to improve. So why V4? Um, Let's go over some of this stuff. So why V4? Up until now, like, for a long time, our focus has been on moon landscapes. Um, and although these are visually distinct from each other, um, they're essentially a single biome uh, planetoid. Um, the, the one is desert, one is icy, one is a lunar landscape. But uh, the biggest difference is, is actually like the type of assets that you see, the shapes and the terrain. Um, last year, when the team uh, started to work on Hurston, we we're actually confronted with our biggest challenge yet. Um, Hurston is a very diverse planet uh, in terms of what we've done so far. So we have uh, dry wastelands, we had our mining pits, um, we have trash yards, we have hot acidic areas, and even very lush green areas. Um, so there's, on a single planet, we had to cover a lot of variety. Um, and this clearly proved a challenge. So based on, on this experience working on, on Hurston, we, uh, we started to think about, okay, what can we do to improve our where are our bottlenecks and how can we proceed? Um, 
So we wanted to make sure that we future-proof the technology because up until now it's been Stanton, but there's uh, this, we want to go somewhere, right? We want to go to other locations, and the only way to do it is to work faster, more e efficient. Um, so V4 is a fundamental change in how fast uh, we can build planets, uh, keeping what worked well, um, reworking the things that slowed us down, and uh, building a tool that's in-engine and is a very intuitive, artist-friendly tool to use. And uh, we'll show some examples of that um, coming up. Uh, yes, all right, cool, seems to work. So here's an example of some of the stuff that we wanted to achieve, or at least wanted to do. Um, wow, what a beautiful planet, that looks familiar. But we felt we couldn't really do. So you see here a Google image of the African continent, and what you can clearly see is on a large scale, the transition from uh, a desert landscape to a savanna to a thick jungle. And it, uh, if, I don't know if any of you uh, ever like, like, joy, um, like, like enjoy to uh, look around on Google Earth. I personally like to do that a lot, uh, reference gathering, etc. And I always enjoy seeing these, these beautiful transitions. Um, and they seem quite like, strong, but if you go up close, you can actually tell that these transitions are like incredibly complex. So there's all these features in the terrain that inform why these transitions happen. Um, in this case, where the, 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 the vegetation gets more lush, you see that the mountainscapes start to block the drier desert winds. Um, the water paths are the first areas where trees start to grow. And when you zoom into these areas, you can actually see how the terrain and how the terrain features actually start to inform these transitions. Uh, another example, I um, just had a, have a few examples to go through. Um, another one where the terrain creates these beautiful patterns um, of transitions in between different biome types. And lastly, wow, please, there we go. Uh, European Alps, where the transition in, in height actually uh, causes a transition from like a regular green area to like the snowy mountains. And these transitions happen over an incredibly large area. So um, let's have a look and go back at, uh, Hurst, to Hurston and have a bit of a chat about the challenges we had. So uh, we were not really unhappy with the, the results that we were getting, um, especially up close. I think that was pretty good, um, especially considering the skill of our game. Um, but we needed a wider range of biomes. And we could only imagine, like, if you think about Terra Prime or anything that's, that's very complex uh, that we still want to do, um, we needed a system that worked smarter and better. So it became clear that our tiled approach uh, was making it really hard to, to scale uh, and create convincing uh, transitions. Help. Next slide. All right, so um, this is a very unflattering look of uh, Hurston. I turned off the atmosphere and some of the, the effects that usually go on top of this. But what we usually do, or tend, uh, did before, was paint a global texture that sort of represents uh, the different areas on a planet. So what we have here is on the pole, it's a bit desaturated, but that's where the savanna area meets the wasteland. And although it's, it's not super crisp, it kind of gets uh, the point across, especially with the effects layered on top of it. When you start flying closer to the surface, especially with all the effects turned off, you start to see where the global texture uh, starts to fill, and you get this blurry look. Uh, the textures that are loaded locally for each patch of terrain or each tile is not fully loaded in, and you hit this dead zone in between where it's, it just looks a bit blurry, a bit muddy, um, and it's not really getting us the results that we look, saw on Google Earth. Um, and then when you get even closer, you start to see the individual patches coming in. Um, the texture of the biome becomes visible, and although up close, this, this is a cool result, uh, especially when you're walking in around it, um, these transitions, yeah, they, they, they can be uh, quite hard. Um, so what you see here is a few um, wasteland tiles, met, like meeting savanna tiles, and um, the artist and the art team had a really hard time just trying to um, alleviate these areas to get, get them as good as possible by creating additional tiles to sort of fit in between, and it, it became uh, quite complex to set up and maintain, especially with uh, more biomes and more variety coming in. Uh, and the drawback from the color map up close is also that it didn't quite uh, have the resolution that we wanted to. 
Um, so more complex man, uh, planets meant more individual files to maintain. Um, all of these collected assets informed the final look. So if you wanted to change a color on the planet, you had to go through all these individual files. Let's use the laser. So we had all these, um, these terrain files, these terrain sets. They had color information as well. So if we wanted the, the red on the planet to be a bit less red, uh, we had to tweak all of those individual files. Could meant that like over 20 or even more. Um, the overall look and final look of the planet was easily made up of 500. All right, I'm going to jump ahead because this is really all culminating into the idea of what I think made this planet tech the best, or rather what brought it to the standard that we expect now. Details aside, this is a really good system, in my opinion, of, of having the planet procedurally de decide what's going on at a specific point. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. In the meantime, though, I would love to hear from you guys. What do you think is the best planet so far? Like, what do you think comes together the best between the four that we have? And to uh, bottom-up approach at the same time, we type of overcome all of the limitations that we had previously. Here's a 2D chart of uh, temperature versus humidity. Um, Michelle mentioned we use these two, uh, these two properties because they seem the most relevant for most uh, variations on a planet's surface, but we're quite loose with the term. Um, the artists have a bit of flexibility what they put into them. And obviously, some planets or moons, especially, maybe humidity isn't relevant for them. We, can, we could theoretically just use any other single measure we want for climate there. But the point is, we've got two axes, two things we can control. So what we do is then, for each individual uh, point on this 2D graph, we get to, we get to pick exactly what we want uh, to appear. So down here, we might have like, you know, obviously snow textures, where we have different types of trees appearing in the temperate rainforest. Um, we get to control the exact appearance at every single location within this chart. And we have 128 graduations of temperature and humidity, which leaves us with 16,000 vari variations we have to fill of to tell you what would appear on the planet at that specific condition, which is quite a lot to fill. Um, but, so here's a quick demo showing how a uh, small terrain patch, just by adjusting the climate data, we can very quickly adjust the visuals. Uh, I'll just play that one again. And you see that we always get like logical shapes and colors coming in there. So yeah, the problem with this now, it generates us a new problem. We've got 16,000 sets of uh, conditions we need to set up somehow. So I think that animation kind of messed up. <laughs> we represented quite a challenge. Our first uh, approach was for them to have, like, they would manually create these rules where I want uh, this tree to appear at this temperature range and at this altitude. And it was, it was too unwieldy. So instead, we moved to a system where we literally paint the surface of the planet using like a paintbrush. So this is uh, a quick demo of this being used here. And because we don't want to paint the entire surface of the planet, when you paint on the surface, you're actually painting what you would like to appear at them climate conditions. So if you paint uh, somewhere that's 20 degrees C and uh, the humidity is 50%, you're actually painting every single point on the planet that has exactly those climate conditions. So by doing it this way, uh, next slide, we can very quickly build up uh, very interesting biomes, and while it looks like you're just painting a small area of land in front of you, you're painting huge areas of the planet at once. Um, and this was something that was immediately appealing to the artists, because this is a very familiar yeah. workflow for anyone that's worked on a game engine uh, before, like a smaller scale one. Um, but yeah, it, it scales up for us. So here we've just painted a few trees. So and bushes, if that doesn't, if you, you didn't catch that, area. basically what he's saying is they can pinpoint thousands of points of temperature and humidity. Um, conditions in as a um, gosh what's the word combination thousands of combinations of humidity and temperature pick that specific point somewhere in the view that you're seeing to paint that certain spot for that humidity and temperature and then everywhere on the planet that matches that spot will get painted the same way it's not been popular. I think everybody did a little happy dance when that, that moment came in yeah. and the, the paint tool came in and <laughs> well. So uh, when, we, when they paint all this data, it goes into what we call a lookup table, which is just that 2D chart. 
Uh, and we generate a whole bunch of different ones. So here's a couple of them, or three of them. Um, so we have the ground color, the type of surface that so it might be, so snow, rock, so that informs the physics engine of what to do there and what textures we should place. But then we also have things like tree coverage, so how much, how much trees would spawn there so that when we, uh, at space level, we can still uh, draw the forests and draw the vegetation where typically most games would have to cull that stuff out. They just couldn't afford to deal with it. We can understand what the, you know, say if we're looking at the Amazon rainforest, we can understand what the color should be. Because we don't really want the ground color from space, like it might be brown in the rainforest, but we want the green of the lush trees above it. So we can generate all this data uh, and we can use it at any altitude and it gives us a lot of power. And also this rich information we can use for various other gameplay effects, which you'll see a bit more of later today. We saw a sneak peek of, uh, on our first demo of how temperature can drive things, but there's a lot to come with the, uh, this, these planet climate conditions. So here's, uh, here's a visualization of the climate on Selin. Uh, the red and green are just uh, visualizations of the temperature and humidity. And one of the lookup tables is shown there, which shows, uh, I think that's the ground color. So once we apply that to the surface, it starts to look a lot more reasonable. Uh, and then same for Microtech, we've got all the climate conditions there. Uh, it's mostly much snow in Microtech, no surprise, but yeah. And then to build it up from the surface to see the other side of it, so this is purely just the terrain plus the global lookup table, so it looks pretty boring at the moment. Uh, once we apply some temperature variations, there's a little bit more interest. Uh, the humidity variations gives us quite a lot. Uh, and then on top of that, we have a um, medium scale type of uh, terrain textures, which are driven from the climate and the slope. And then finally, we have the, uh, the detail textures. Now, our climate data is only stored at four meter resolution. So that doesn't give us you know, the, the individual stones and rocks. We have to add a layer of detailed ground texture. But we need them textures to look consistent with what the climate data tells us. So if the climate table tells us we should be having uh, yellow sand here, then we may need to make sure we have yellow sand. Now, we can't make a texture for every single scenario. So the solution for that is we normalize all of our ground textures so that they all have uh, an average of mid-gray color. Just jumping forward a bit here again. I think they show the tool off working quite a bit, but... I may be wrong. Let's see what they're saying here. You can see the wireframe mesh geometry uh, generated from elevation data. The terrain geometry and blending is done on CPU. Um, this is the same view as before. We're showing the planet terrain without any objects yet. And this is the final view with objects generated on terrain. So we have a separation between large scale ecosystems which are the larger rocks, trees, and so on. And then we have the so-called ground cover objects, which are the smaller objects that are generated at ground level only. Um, additionally, we have improved the cliffside generation. Um, yeah, the objects are placed based on climate data and object preset settings. And we are using LOD clusters for large-scale forest rendering, which you will see in Microtech. Um, at ground level, we have additional parallax and ground texture details. So, physics. The collision geometry is generated on demand on client and servers when players and spaceships are interacting right, with the physics This is getting screen. crunchy, and I know you nerds in the chat are loving this, but we still got plenty to go through. So we're going to jump forward a little bit here into, I believe, the beginning of 2020. This is a few months later. And this is them basically coming back to that same group of people where we watched the R-Corp moons being developed. Remember they said four weeks for a moon uh, or something like that? I think they did three moons in one quarter was, was how they did it. So here is them talking about now, how long ago was that? That was, that was here. Um, so that was January of 2019. We are jumping basically one year ahead to February of 2020. Let's see what they have to say. When we began working on the Planet Tech, we had no idea that we would land where we are right now. So the process was uh, a little different this time in comparison to uh, the entire planet rework that we have done just before our CitizenCon. These three moons now are just made with the V4 with no 
attachment to any previous visuals that we had to accomplish. We simply could make use of the entire library that we have to our disposal, take the rocks from the caves, create snow or ice materials for them, and arrange them in a different manner, and then give them an entirely different look. Creating new assets for these moons. You have to see what's there, what can I do, what can I make with it, how can I reuse it, how can I make it, how can I use two old things and make one new thing out of it, basically. One of the major reasons why we went for V4 is to increase quality. We don't want to make moons faster but reduce quality. We actually want to raise both of them. Even this scene alone if I think is like, even like this right here is so much better than the Delamar we saw back here. <laughs> like the ground just night and day. But reduce quality, we actually want to raise both of them. If I think back to how long Lyria took us, it was two people for one month straight. But uh, Pascal, for example, in not even a month, is taking on two moons. Um, I'm taking on one moon. So it is definitely a lot faster. So it sounds like in a year they went from two people doing, what did he say, two people four weeks to do one moon down to one person doing two moons in, I think he said the same amount of time basically. So they made good progress over the course of just that one year using V4. But as was pointed out by Keller in the chat, V5 is actually going to take that a step further with new processes. Area took us. It was two people for one month straight. But uh, Pascal, for example, in not even a month is taking on two moons. Um, I'm taking on one moon. So it is definitely a lot faster. I think for me personally, when I start working on a new planet, it's always helpful to start with what is the vibe that you get on this planet. The cool thing about these moons is the fact that we, we get like this very high level mood shot, so to say, like a concept that, that gives us a rough direction what this moon is supposed to look like. You have like really just three shots and that's basically all we have. So all of these moons have to kind of fit into that frozen snow ice theme that Microtech brings with it by default. So the first thing that you will notice when, when actually looking at every single moon individually is of course the, the slightly different color schemes, but I would say the most important feature that, that is really different is the distribution and type of ocean we have on every single one of those. So one of them has no ocean at all, the second one has an ocean that is completely frozen though, and the third one has an actually fluid ocean. So uh, that was one of the ways we could distinguish all of them and make them look interesting, but still fit into that entire theme. In the end, we really have uh, a very large uh, emotional attachment to, to these moons because they are, in fact, 90% our work and our input and our ideas. So we have the go, no-go meeting tomorrow, and um, I personally believe that uh, the moons are in a very good state. Most of the content is already there, so we have also already uh, given them out to other departments to apply content on top, so design is already working on them, VFX started touching them. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 from my point of view, I don't see a reason why there should be a no-go. <laughs> uh, what, what if it doesn't? <laughs> I'll be... Uh, I'll be... Uh, then I am the liar of the year, and it's only February. <laughs> this was a go, by the way. It ended up working out. It's no option. It has to go in. It has to go in. Right? There's, there's no such thing as a no-go. It has to happen. We will make it happen. Don't worry about it. We will make it happen. Deadly words. Deadly words, dude. Don't worry about it. Coming to owners in the upcoming All right. alpha. So that was a little update on the moons at that time. Again, February 2020, they were making good, good progress in getting things working. Spring 2020 was when we started to see something a little new. They started to introduce us to Pyro's planets for the first time because, well, they were <laughs> at least trying to tell us that Pyro was coming soon back then. But oh my God. Here we are. Don't worry, I don't need a reminder. I am very well aware of how freaking late it is compared to this, but here is a look at the first real looks of what they were showing us of Pyro and, and its planets back then.
But honestly, this still just kind of looks like a pyromaniac's paradise to me. Speaking of pyromaniacs and what might be the best or worst segue I've made all season, it's time for another look at early work on the planets of the Pyro system, in this case, Pyro 2. Now, in the original galactic guide for the Pyro system, Pyro 2 was said to be a coreless planet that once held significant mineral deposits and became the victim of a, of a metal rush that quickly picked the planet clean, leaving it little more than an empty husk. And, well, we may have to revisit that assessment before all is said and done. Similar to our look at Pyro 1 last month, this is early work on the planet's surface alone, so you can expect plenty of changes and improvements along the way before it gets plopped into the Pyro system with its family of other planets. But it's fun to showcase what Planet Tech B4... Okay, just because I like the side-by-side, -side, here is a look at what this planet looks like now. They the improvements that definitely we made to the how acid spawn on the side of mountains. Cook up that was something that was always quite challenging for us days. to do, to have some natural transition from the terrain to the geometry and then also have like the rocks form in a natural way. Granted, there's a lot more finished work going on here, but you can definitely see how they've improved from these early looks. All right, after that, we got a Star Citizen Live which was kind of like the one that we saw about all of the humidity and temperature stuff. But this one was more talking about height maps and how they were actually creating the geometry of the planet, which I thought was pretty interesting. So I thought I'd give you a couple of looks at different parts of this um, just to show you kind of the, the tile format in which they were building planets back then. It's the planet side stuff. So planet side art related stuff. That's our topic. That's the stuff Patrick will be able to speak to today. So, Patrick, if you want to share your screen, I'll turn it over to you, and I'll let you, uh, let you drive for a little bit. All right. Let's... So, do you see my screen? In a second, Zoom is put it on the wrong screen. There we go. Uh, now we see your screen. Oh, good. You see Substance Designer? Yep. Fantastic. All right. So um, as you already said, Jared, we are going to take a look at um, a bit more uh, like an in-depth look when it comes to height map creation. Some of these things uh, changed as well. Uh, you have talked about the CitizenCon um, Citizen Con demo that we have done in 2000, I think by the end of, it was the end of 2018, I think so, mm -hmm. um, where we showed off the, the process here. Uh, but since then, a lot of things changed, and it has to do with the swap from V4 to no, from V3 to V4. Um, and yeah, uh, we thought let's let's have a bit of fun. Let's create one of these height maps from scratch. And uh, by the way, explain some of the changes that have happened, how it uh, affects us as the art team, how much time uh, we get back from this, um, how how it affects quality and so on and so on. You know, uh, so yeah. How, 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 how would you describe this shape? What, what, what would you say this shape looks like? This shape looks like a paraboloid. <laughs> this is official, like, this is, you, you can basically swap uh, shapes here. And the official name for this shape is a, par a paraboloid. Did he say I tried? Swap, uh, <laughs> this is official, like, <laughs> this is, you, you can basically swap uh, shapes here. And the official name for this shape is a par a paraboloid. Jared wanted you to say boob. But, uh, I refer uh, to it as a simple blob. So, <laughs> All right. not, uh, not very scientific, but whatever. Uh, so yeah, let's take a look at the editor real quick. So this is a, a slightly modified version of Microtech that I have here. And if I fly around, you can see that I have my my blob paraboloid shape um, on the planet already. Looks very natural. Looks very natural, right? But this is usually, um, you know, or one of the many ways that you could start with. Um, what you can see, though, is that, you know, the how the color is distributed. If you look at all the other height maps around it, you, you have you have decent, you know, visuals it kind of all makes sense you can see that there are mountains and then there are valleys and they're filled with some gravel and such and it all follows the shapes nicely and so uh it, the same thing happens for this shape but you can see how 
this flatland here that has this swirly, like a swirly pattern to it, kind of creeps up our our half sphere here. And hmm. it has to do with how um, our height maps blend together. It's not like we can simply produce or throw in this height map texture and it will always be the exact same or this exact uh, cutout and visual. Because a lot of things happen in the editor on top, right? That might influence the, the visual or the look of our height maps. Um, let's take a look over here. You can see that this blob appears many more times all over the planet. And since it's really ge a geometrical shape, the data uh, that you can see on it looks kind of janky right now. Uh, this is and obviously sometimes a, a very young planet and it's preteen years going through <laughs> some... Uh, oh, God, Jared. <laughs> Jesus. Something like that. But you can see that, you know, sometimes these shapes blend together. And sometimes we get we get multiple frequencies of these things blending together and forming entirely different formations, and this is this is the um, this is something we have to take into account. Um, but it's also the beauty of uh, of our planet tech in general because from one height map by shifting it around and making it blend with itself and blend with all the other surrounding height maps, we get very very nice happy accidents like these that produce very interesting results. Planet pimples. So okay. let's go back to our original. I'm going to go a little bit forward because there are some interesting height maps he makes here. And he'll show you it in real time as he generates them. Note that simply gives you that result in an instant, right? Yeah. So this is already quite believable uh, when it comes to the basic shapes. And, and now I can take this and further detail it out. But before we do so, let's let's just simply check it out in the editor, as we always do, because ultimately how it looks like in Substance Design Designer doesn't interest me that much. I need to know that it really looks great in the editor, right? Oh, so now like another of one of these happy accidents happened. I can okay. see my, my features, but what 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 happened here right i can i can double check here these values are all like be below gray right so this right. thing should be bumping up but it's bumping down so i need to adjust that maybe adjust the range is not have it be too extreme oh actually like this sorry okay and there we go. Now you can see the, the visuals that I get in, in the substance design of viewport are already highlighting these tips red. That means, you know, they're high. So uh, it's, it's high elevation. So I can export this again. And, you know, this is already quite interesting. I don't, yeah. I don't hate this, right? Uh, if I reload again, just by changing these values, I get a completely different visual. Suddenly, like, you know, it's, it's, it's bumping up my landscape. This look how it looks from the top. You know, you can see these forms deforming and shifting into one another. It's quite cool. It's a very good base to work uh, to work yeah. from. The, the the scale is interesting because when we look at it in Substance Designer, mm -hmm. it's 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 I, I'm seeing it on like a much more like macro scale. When I see it, when I, when yes. I saw what you were in macro in Substance Designer, I. I see that and I look at something like that and I expect that to be like an entire mountain range. And then mm -hmm. but because this this uh, uh, this particular height map is only mapped to this one little area here, it's actually a much more condensed thing. Exactly. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'm explaining myself. Uh, but uh, remember when I told you about how our, um, our height maps are splatted on the planet and sometimes right. if they are two right next to one another, they will be blending together as well. So we can check that out as well here, like simply by flying over and seeing how it all behaves. So look at this. This is the exact same height map, but it's, but it's, it sits here multiple times and blends together and forms an even greater landscape, even greater mountain range. <laughs> Instead of just being a single dot on the planet, it gives you that, that individual mountain and then you know, if, if, I, if I would like to detail this out, um, let's take one of these tools here. And, and this is where we 
and we're not getting into the painting as much now but um if i wanted to i can take aslem's heavy spruce tree areas and be like okay you know what i want the spruce trees to live on this plane here and i click in here once and there we go spruce trees some of the stuff is, some of the other things are uh, bleeding in you can see that has to be adjusted so um this is where you know we start polishing things out and such uh, really clean that up and this is without any detail passes and you can kind of see that here that the data looks and it, even after the detail pass uh, there might be some areas where you get to see um one okay this the is the most important the, part of the talk in my opinion uh, and automatically use the correct material based on a planet temperature, size, atmosphere, and stuff? Or do you have to go in and set all of those things individually each time? Mm. So it is something that we have been discussing in the team as well. And yes, there is a, uh, there is an option. Uh, you, you see that... Okay, let, let's let's let's. I have destroyed. Uh, don't don't. Uh, we have wrecked. I have the flashing blue is the thing we were talking about before, where he can select a certain point and it will paint all of the points on the planet that correspond to that point. So when you see that moving around, that's kind of showing what would affect if he were to click. Yeah, right <laughs> we have wrecked it a little. Yeah, that's but that's fine. Um, if you take a look at this square over here, right, it's something that we have already discussed, right? Um, I can take, for example, the ob obsidian dark uh, biome and paint it down, and you can see that it automatically gets applied here, right? Mm -hmm. So what we could do, because this texture and each and every corner of this texture resembles um, specific humidity and temperature situations, uh, like uh, the top right is cold and dry. The bottom right is uh, hot and dry. The bottom left is um, cold. No, wait. Hot and cold, wet. Cold, dry. Uh, hot, dry, warm, cold, wet, warm, hot, wet. Warm, dry, warm, wet, and then cold, wet. Yeah, exactly. So I could basically go in and, and paint something paint something in that resembles the, or that would uh, logically resemble some um, climate, for example, if, if, if it was Earth, right? Uh, I could, where it's, where it's cold and dry, I could put my Arctic areas and really paint this square out completely un, unrelated to any of any planet or, or anything really. And then we could throw any data at it and it would redistribute this data uh, logically. So no, we don't the the answer would be we we don't have to go in and uh, adjust the painting all the time and repaint our biomes and because you can see even even after or even only this local height map here it already adjusts to the new data and the same thing is happening globally so it's the it's the very oops sorry it's the very very same logic be, being applied there so uh, just by adjusting our workflow slightly, we could totally do that. Yeah. yeah. So this this height map that we've been working on, uh, we, we've seen that it's it's in this one place we focus on, but we also see, have seen that it's replicated in other places. Yeah. Uh, how how what's that breakup like? Uh, how many different patches are there on a planet? How do you how do you keep these things from being too repetitious? Oh. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. the power of DevTools. Um, you can see that what we have been adjusting and modifying right now is uh, index or patch number three, right? You refer to it as patches. Uh, it's actually okay. Um, we tweaked patch number three. Right next to us is, is patch number zero. And let me show you something. Um, we have a list in our planet editor tools. Whoops. Oh, let's actually put it in here. It's okay. So, this is something that we should that we don't show off quite frequently. But you can see that we have our ecosystems, and what we call as ecosystems are all the height maps, right? This is the list of all the height maps that we use on all our planets. We have 
we have hills, we have ice dunes, we have the mining pit. Or oh, you can actually also let's let's do it properly here. You have a preview of all of it here. You have the mining pits. You have mountains eroded and all of that stuff, right? So it's a, it's a it's a huge library of height maps, yeah. all kinds of flatlands, beaches, and, and so that, on and so on. So what I can do is simply select that second patch, and for instance, fill it with um, fill it with something entirely different, which is uh, let's do mountain billowy. Mountain, yeah, mountain billowy. O2. <laughs> That's my favorite. All right. Let's jump back to our spot. Oh, that was actually three, not two. Sorry, three. Whoops. And now turn this off so you can actually see what's happening. And this is a good demonstration of the question that was asked previously. See, these are the, the billowy mountains, and you can see that the data already um, adjusted. But if I go back and put in something entirely new now, See everything moved with it. Um, let's take some. Let's take a height map that you guys have actually never seen before. It's not on any of the current planets yet. You saw it here first. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can just, I can just go through this library and decide, like, okay, what mountains could fit best, right? And I can. I, I can define, uh, as, as I've shown before, so you, you see these funky colors, right? It's 0 to 15, so we have 15 patches, 15 slots that we can fill. So I can decide on a lineup of 15 different height maps. That's, yeah, there's a single volcano right here. Yeah. Now, it's 15 different height maps, but each height map is used differently as well yeah so we can is, it's not just a repeat every 15 that's cool get closer to that i want to see that you can see where bedrock is automatically we get these bedrock assets spawning in and defining out these slopes because you know it, it is just displacing uh, upwards so if you want more silhouette from it, you have to um, put assets on top, which we scan, uh, scan, sorry, scatter on top procedurally as we do with anything else. And that's how we can detail these out. Uh, so I would, before I asked you to zoom in on that, we were talking about how each version of those 15 are still different from each other. Uh, the different different height yeah it's 15 unique individual completely different height maps yeah but but each version of 3 is not exactly the same as, as we've seen at the beginning how 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 does it how does it make each version of, no, of uh, height map 3 different okay so um it is it is the exact same texture every single time but if i get in that um, volcano again then like 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 when, when, when we had that blob at the beginning, some places we had one blob, some places we had two blobs, some places exactly we had blobs exactly, and together. it's um, maybe that's not the best. Let's take this one for instance. Hmm, not very visible too. Yeah, the blob was probably the best example for that, but fundamentally, it's the thing that I've already explained to you. Um, let's show this one again. So. The, the third patch here is isolated, right? If there's no third patch around it. Mm -hmm. But if we um, check this spot, for example, there are two, two patches um, next to one another, right? So what we do in, like what the planet tech does for us, let's take these mountains, for instance, it takes a height map and then it starts shifting it around. And then it starts blending it with itself. So you get you will get to see a, a somewhat new and unique look every single time you pass by this height map because it's it's blended together with its surroundings in a new way every single time. Gotcha. So yes, it is it is a little different every single time, but it's still the same texture. Yeah. We so, we just you know we uh, have these tricks and 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 processes that 
that allow us to make it look super unique by shifting the information around, blending it with all its surroundings. And the cool thing is every other height maps do the same, you know, and by by that you get this huge mumbo jumbo of, 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 of blended height maps and every everything looks kind of unique. So there's a lot of like, so, so, so they can so do a version. lot with this and I think they have, but we still haven't really seen ultimately how far they can go because the planets that we're using are still very generic. They're all terraformed planets. They're all made for human life. And I think Pyro will be kind of the first time we really get to see them go a little wild with this, which we'll see a little later in this whole video. But um, even past Terra, I expect these star systems to get more and more interesting, more exotic, more um, extraterrestrial, I guess. And like what's being talked about here in, in chat, uh, we'll get lava at some point. We'll get precipitation, weather patterns and stuff is going to continue to improve. And now that we've reached this sort of level of 2020, what we're going to start to see here is uh, how they have specialized their technology to make these planets more unique. So this this actually starts to wrap up that initial version of planet tech they wanted to be done for the planets to be able to build easily. And from here, we'll, we'll start moving more into the specifics after this demo. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's a decent decently long um decently long substance graph but it's it's still super manageable and and uh and okay and the, this is the result we get from this mm -hmm. um let's uh, push this one away because we want to focus on that guy so we have these mountains there's some heavy erosion going on right you can see that we have um we have some some wind erosion or some type of erosion that started eroding one side but not the other indicating that there's there might be some winds going on or um uh, soil sliding down the hill as you can see by these streaks and such uh and something that uh you already mentioned uh, uh jared is you know we can always go back to a node and then change an aspect about it and then generate a completely new height map from this so let's say i'm super happy with the result and everything works as i wanted to and now I'm going to work on Pyro and let's say we need 15 of those, right? Because we have 15, no, sorry, 16 slots, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so let's say we need 15 of those. Okay, so I can basically be like, okay, I'm going to take this um, and simply, you know, change the seed, a random seed. So it will simply generate a new variation of that very first node. But since that changed, all the other nodes will change as well. And in the end, as you can see now, I'll get a completely different result. Mm -hmm. By just changing a single value, I can produce a completely new height map. Um, again, not something specific to us. This is... You can see how this can start to be plugged into machine learning to create some full surfaces without him having to do all of the different changes to these nodes very like by now this is standard in the entire uh, games industry procedural materials um this is this is how uh, most material artists work uh, but we are applying this to height maps so now i can for instance change this from a basic noise to a billowy noise and it will again completely alter the look um, of this height map and give me an entirely different result I can also flatten it out if I want something uh, flatter. Okay, this is a little too extreme, <laughs> right? But uh, let's say um, I go down. Oh, with that the looks sick! I'd love to fly through that and and restrict the range to something healthier here because not all the mountains are using the entire range of our spectrum. And there we go. See, just by adjusting two things quite quickly, I can produce uh, an entirely new result. If I'm happy with this, I'm exporting it to the editor, which I can do. Validate it on the planet. Oh, I have actually replaced it. So I'm going to get back to it. There it is. Blop. Did I export it? 
export again. And of course, it's important to remember that this is a height map that's being designed for the terrain of Pyro and not one that was designed yeah. for the terrain of Microtech. So yeah. uh, the finished result you're going to see here is not exactly uh, the intended. No, this is, yeah, this is just for demonstration purposes, yeah. right? But you can see that parts of the height map are showing and other hearts are hidden because it's blending into all the other height maps. And uh, yeah, as, as we already mentioned a couple of times, all the biomes, all the spruce trees here, um, I can... For for instance, now take uh, an obsidian area and paint it in here if I like to, right? And change the entire um, biome and object scattering that we have on this specific area. And yeah, this is this is how we go about the creation of height maps. Basically, these procedures, these workflows, going back and forth, validating in substance, validating in the editor, uh, checking if our um, if our biomes are painted down correctly and if they if the if the data like these streaks here if it all picks up well if it's not too noisy making test drives on these right will people hate us or not <laughs> uh, so <laughs> this is if there's that many rocks how, yeah how we go about these things yeah this is this is it and i think we're done jared right yeah we're done Awesome. Any questions? Any closing? No, we're, we're, we're out of time. You can stop your screen share. <laughs> okay. All right. So that I think that's a really informative look. This is actually a great one to watch. It's from October 2020. It's called Making Mountains. A good Star Citizen Live to watch all the way through, but we won't be touching the whole thing today. Um, now, here is... That, like I said, kind of marked when they were like, okay, Planet Tech V4 solid we're, we're ready to move forward we have developed all of the land terrain in stanton we know our baseline this is where we're moving from and then they started talking about clouds for those of you who were here for those years you <laughs> remember how much we were waiting for clouds they talked about clouds we're building clouds first they put them in space but we were all really interested in when they'd come to planets and finally with the introduction of crusader after years and years of talk uh, about five months after this, we got our introduction to cloud tech and star citizen and planets. I felt goosebumps, so I don't, I don't know. I, I hope you feel the passion, not just from, from the, the audio team, but from everyone that poured a lot of work into this. I hope music gives justice to, to the thousands of men hours that were put in this, this place. It's just so much better than we ever hoped it would be when we started working on Crusader half a year ago. Very, very different than what you'd see, you know, this huge vistas to look at, uh, these beautiful sunsets to look at, but also almost too perfect a world. I guess the biggest reaction that we're trying to create is this insane sense of scale. And we really want to capture that sense of, of Orison just sprawling out into the distance. I've seen our backers get excited about all kinds of tiny little details that you'd think, ah, that doesn't really matter. but. The first time I saw it for myself, it was beautiful. I'll be honest, it'll only get better from here. The things that give an environment character... So this is just... a lot about Orison, um, but ultimately it was like the clouds that were <laughs> the highlight of this whole thing. Realistic looking clouds that are convincing for the player, or like for everybody, obviously. Um, there's always going to be Earth, but Art Direction wanted something less Earth-like and a bit more alien, if you will. And that was one of the bigger challenges. I definitely know there's some uh, visual artifacts that you can see sometimes in high contrast areas or in the distance and stuff. But I know that if it's not fixed by 3.14, that Carson and the team will uh, definitely be able to work on those and improve those. Uh, in, in the future and for the record we saw those improvements this year with the new cloud changes i think it was this year 
Was it the end of last year or was it this year? I think it was this year, 323. We got those cloud improvements that have really helped with those artifacts. I think it's great that the cloud tech is going out as it is, because it does look amazing. Everything that's gonna have clouds will use this technology. Just from what is there already, it's so promising that we have no doubt it's gonna be amazing once it's fully realized and deployed in the whole universe. For the planet, we wanted to feel the more uh, grandeur element of Crusader. It's a fantastic planet. I think the music is the first thing that makes you understand the culture and the, um, the tone of the place. The guidance I got from Darren when you land is that you wanted to feel as if you were looking at uh, an eternal sunset or something like that. I mean, kind of like a, makes you go into the most human part of you. And for the industrial part, we wanted to, to make sure we felt the grandeur of the industrial mind of engineers that uh, work there and, uh, and construct all the beautiful ships that we have in the star system. I certainly really way much more deeper than usual, uh, even more deeper. I mean, I, I try to go deeper and deeper in every, everything I go, so hope you guys enjoy it. Dude, we always like your music, Pedro. Dude composes such beautiful music, oh my god. Like all of these, uh, all these places have just really great soundtracks. Sometimes they feel a little too epic, and I'm okay with that. So this was just a quick look at like the cloud tech stuff going on. I actually think, do they talk about clouds here? I think they might actually talk about the cloud development they did here too. Do they? Mm. Hold on, let me see if I can, whoops. It's in here somewhere. I think there was a Citizen Con show. 314, welcome to Orison. Why don't we watch a trailer, honestly? <laughs> like, it's just, I don't, I am, I am, I, it's beautiful. <laughs> you heard the music. I'm happy to just watch this just because it's great. This isn't really that important to Planet Tech, but let's watch it anyways. Isno, thank you so much for the membership. Keep that garden growing, my friend. Appreciate you. Okay, that's all the planet stuff. <laughs> I'll say this, we, we said we kind of agreed on Microtech being the best planet in the system, but Crusader has the most potential, I think. This could be, Crusader and Orison could just be something that you just can't match in any other game. And I can't wait to see what they do with it with the new tech they're bringing in. So here are some interesting updates on um planet stuff this is actually the part so i told you guys that we would talk about orbits planetary orbits uh eventually they will orbit the star that's the plan and with those orbits will come changed cargo routes changed economies 
changed uh, amount of time to quantum travel around the system and also seasons. So here is a little update on what's going on with planets. This is 2021 CitizenCon and in here is just a teeny tiny bit about seasons, but I think it's really interesting because I'm pretty sure it's the only time they've ever talked about it. In the game, the first thing that I did was a complete overhaul of how we spawn the objects. We used to spawn them on each terrain patch as that terrain patch was created, but this meant that we were limited in our control in that we could only spawn new objects when we were creating new terrain patches. The new system has an entirely separate grid division of the planet, and this means that we have a lot more control over the resolution of our objects when they're spawned and how we spread it across multiple frames, which means that we get better performance in the client. This also means that we add, we're we able to add a setting for the clients to control how far away each object preset was spawned. The next improvement we've started to look at is making the ecosystems react to their situation and surroundings more. For example, we can now introduce scaling biases for temperature and humidity so that certain objects when in higher humidity can be bigger or smaller and the same for temperature. I guess that would be good for plants. new designed for animal like and jungle. entity spawning. If you have a jungle biome and it's growing in a drier place, maybe it's not growing as large plants. I don't think I even considered that when they showed this before. Using tokens, which means that we can specialize our object presets better for different planets. For example, we have something similar for rocks. That means if you put a rock on a snowy planet, it goes snowy. And if you put it on a sandy planet, it looks sandy. Now we can do something similar for animals. We can specify a small herbivore, for example, and in the snow, this might spawn some sort of Arctic rabbit. And in the jungle, this might spawn something completely different. We've also begun to experiment with a new foliage shader that takes into account the health of the plant based on its surroundings again, and the current season of the planet. Though what you're seeing on the screen is far from final. In the same vein That's as that, we've been working towards having- that is literally all we've ever heard about seasons <laughs> so there there you go if you wanted some information on that uh that's that's all we know but being will being the river guy he will get into rivers here but we're gonna go further on that in a little bit being more dynamically placed biomes around natural areas We've created dressing object presets that are automatically placed around coasts and of course my favorite thing to work on rivers in the most recent couple months, I've been doing more work on the rivers to prepare them to be closer to what we would consider shippable so that we can get them out to the players. This has included finer control of both the shape of our rivers as they flow from springs to larger rivers, but also the objects that spawn around our rivers so we have control over what spawns in the water, what is spawning on the banks of the river, and what is spawning further away and blending it into the biome that it flows through. The other thing that we've added as well is a wet edge around rocks, both in the sea and in rivers, which reflects the fact that they were probably wet from the river, and so they look a lot more shiny. We've so also been working you can definitely get the vibe, though, with these conversations that we're starting to have here, that they've moved on from the idea of just making planets, and now they're starting to try and customize them, make them feel a little more unique to the river system so that we can have more natural pauses in our river systems and other bodies of water than just the oceans. Another major change was to stop using the planet's ocean mesh and just displacing it up to the river and instead building specific river mesh sections around the river. This means that we can have far more control over the shape of the water and we can use our own specific river material and shader, meaning that we can specify colors, flow, and other properties of the river water separately to the ocean of that planet. Rivers aren't done yet, but they're closer to being used in production than ever before. The next steps include a planet populating tool, so one click to create an entire river system across a planet. We'll talk about and that. Maybe working on a little bit of lava flow, but we'll have to see when that comes. Told ya, they're gonna get to lava at some point. Next is uh, Mark and Morgan. Thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, Besk, you are absolutely right. The idea of these planets is that you're supposed to be able to just live around a planet and not be flying back and forth to a bunch of places. So that's that's where like points of interest and stuff come in, I think, and the mission systems they're developing. But we're still so far from that. It's it's kind of awful trying to stick around one planet and run missions and stuff. And the missions themselves are just so stale right now. Honestly, we... I'm hoping post 4.0, we see just a complete wipeout of the missions that we have as they bring a new variety and more narrative to them. Okay, so here's something that we haven't really talked about, but was introduced quite a bit before this point. I think it was back during 
like 2019-ish, 2020, they introduced caves. But this is just an introduction to the new caves they were making for these planets. Um, they're still working on them. I think they're introducing acidic biome caves in 4.0, but really they, I think they want to have different caves for every biome, including ice, acidic, maybe eventually lava and stuff like that. But here's some talk about caves, which is just another point of interest that they're trying to diversify planets with. The new workflow we figured out for the caves is much more art artist friendly and to a point even where designers can make entire cave rooms without necessarily needing an artist to do any work. The designer could go in and build like a white box room and send us to the Houdini process, which would then return an almost finished cave room. For the first release, there will be new sand caves on Stamile, which is like the prime candidate being a very desert planet. But they will also be going on Magda, Ita, Wala, and Hurston himself. One thing we really liked about the old caves was that they always had this feeling of claustrophobia, and we tried to keep that in some regards. Another thing that was always a concern at the old ones was that it was very bumpy to walk through them. So one thing we definitely improved on is walking through them and traversing the space is much smoother and feels nicer in general. Also, we added um, a lot more natural light sources, so you will have much more cinematic experiences going through them. I actually hate this. I, I, this is one of my least favorite parts of these cave systems is they just threw artificial lights into them when it feels like it should just be natural openings up to the, to the surface, but you look up and there's nothing there. You walk around on the surface and I don't think you'll find these holes that are leading lights down in there. And I, I don't like that. I wish that they would change that. The first release there will be no missions, but this hopefully very soon will be remedied shortly. And also for the first release, the caves will be walkable on foot only, like no vehicle entrances, no ship entrances, but the workflow is flexible enough to accommodate those once we get to those. Like this first release is mostly about showing the community the visual we've developed for this archetype. Additional archetypes that are like we are scheduled to work on uh, in the next one year, um, it's going to be the, the rock archetype, which will replace the existing caves. Um, you know, I don't think we've even gotten that. Granted, he said they were scheduled to work on them in the next year, so they might have started work on them in 2023, but they're not quite done yet. We did see a lot of that talk in the monthly reports, though, about new cave types last year. Then we also have the acidic archetype, which will fit in into Ariel and less parts of Stanton, where like those those bubbling acid pools, or salt. So that's what we're getting pools. in 4.0. Um, then there's also the ice archetype, which <gasps> will be great for Microtech and the moons, for example. Can't wait for ice. And then hopefully we do get ice mining in this game, because that would be cool to be able to go down into to caves and do some of that stuff. The old pick up the water, remember the cant, all that jazz. Last one that's actually scheduled is the overgrown one which will also work well with Microtech in the forest. Oh, and, uh, I forgot about that. We've actually seen, I think, maybe one look at overgrown caves. Um, I think I might have a footage of that. Did I spell that wrong? Underground? Let's try this. May have footage of the overgrown cave here somewhere. Let's see. Yeah, it'd be right around here. I hate the way that my NAS loads. It, It's so jarring. Um, yeah, here we go. So this is what I think he's, he's referring to when he talks about Overgrown, which I think looks beautiful. And this is the kind of stuff that they ultimately do want to connect to underground facilities at some point. These sorts of like underground mining and industrial areas. You can see it's a little overgrown here. These are the places where they would send you down with like a rock or a mule and have you be doing some more industrial work. This is the stuff that are supposed to be in the UGFs or as they're calling them right now, distribution centers. 
because they haven't added the underground part to them. And it will provide more of the gameplay that we don't see right now. Right now we get a lot of combat gameplay and cargo hauling gameplay with the distribution centers. But once they start building out these underground areas, we are supposed to get more mining and refining and kind of industrial style stuff. And the idea is that they will eventually connect to some of these cave cave networks, which is, I think, a very, very cool idea. On the, on the house, we as a team are quite proud of the experience we managed to achieve with the new cave archetype that's coming out. It was really fun for us to do, I like make this excursion and try to figure out all the problems that come with that. We're looking forward to building all the other archetypes as well. The established workflow now would just go much faster and hopefully result in some really cool looking new places the player can experience. Alpha 318 is slated to bring with it a number of new aspects. Thank you, Jared. Yeah, there are elevators that are supposed to go down into those underground facilities. You actually see that. Here these elevators, but they just don't function yet to actually take you down there. You can only get to the entrance room where you can see the top of them. I think actually he's got, we've got footage of that right here. So this is what, this is the distribution center we have right now. You might recognize this room. I don't know if he looks over to the side, um, but this is the room where everything is kind of centralized in distribution centers you eventually get to. There are elevators on the end here that you are supposed to be able to take down. And look at how long this ride is going all the way down. Like, these places are going to be massive. If that's the ground level that they just left, he's about to look down here in a second. You see how far underground you're actually going. And so this is the part of distribution centers or underground facilities, whatever you want to call them, that we don't have yet. And I think these will eventually start connecting to some of these caves. But not yet. So that was some talk about caves. Here we have more talk about rivers. This is a pretty cool talk. It's, it's River Guy again, and he's talking about he spent a couple of years showing us how they were developing rivers just to make rivers work in the game, make the water flow, make the pathing make sense and all that. But then he came back with this, which is kind of like what he talked about earlier, a way to basically make it so that when they make a planet, that planet can logically know where to place rivers so they don't have to do it anymore, which is pretty cool. And again, just another advancement of the tools they're using to try and build these planets out. We're going to attempt to manually place a river here. I'm going to click. As you can see, we've now got a set of nodes. And this part of the process hasn't changed. So I'll still go down to the river, click on any of the nodes. And I will click place river. And boom, we've got our river. I can then hide the debug nodes. And the river is there in the world. As simple as that. But actually, we're wanting something a little more complex than that. We're wanting entire water systems across the entire planet. And that's what the auto river placement tab is for. The automatic river placement is split up into four steps. The first step is the gather. This looks for positions where we have a rough idea that there will be a river that fulfills certain criteria. And we use the prediction that we saw a moment ago to do this. We can change various settings, such as the target river quantity, the min macro steps, which is the number of those large steps we saw a moment ago for the river to be considered, and the number of attempts of positions it will do while trying to find these. In this example, I'm just going to try and find five rivers across the planet, and I'm going to say each of them needs to have at least nine macro steps. So we're talking about pretty long rivers. We can also select which biomes we want the rivers to be able to flow through. In this case, I've selected all of them apart from the snowy ones. To be honest, I'm sorry to, to um, interrupt this, but this story of how they developed the river tool feels like the best example of how they've been doing all of this this whole time. This dude came and introduced us to the idea that he wanted to make rivers. Let me actually take you back to that episode because it's... It's such a good story. Like it just shows how 
each of the devs might take. You know what it reminds me of kind of? They used to talk about how in Google, back in the day, you'd have your, can't remember what they called it, but it was like you'd have a certain amount of time that you could spend on something that you felt strong about that you wanted to introduce to the company and eventually turn into something. I think this is how Gmail became a thing. A couple of, a couple of different Google products actually started like this. And the idea was that one dev or team of devs or however many devs wanted to focus on one thing could go in and make something that they felt was good, that they felt could help the company. And eventually when it got to a point where they were confident in it, they could introduce it to the rest of the company and possibly bring it into the main development branch. And I feel like that's kind of how this happened. Um, obviously this was, this was like mandated by the company. They wanted to have Rivers, but Will has been the face of this the whole time. And he showed us from this very, very beginning concept of how he wanted to make Rivers to what we're watching now. And I think this is cool. To hear, for the water to have traveled to this point, we can't have it flow up on the terrain. So once we're happy with our river path, we can look at adding any contributing springs. So for example, we might have a bit more water flow coming from there, or I might choose to have a bit more water flow coming from there. And then we can score and clean the rivers. What this does is it works out a more detailed path between the nodes that the river is going to take. And it also works out how much water is going to be passing through each point. So you see, if I click on this node here, we can see the size is five. But if I go a little bit downstream, where there's going to be more rainwater collecting into the stream, the size is 17. And that will increase all the way down to the bottom where the river ends. Once we're happy with the river system as a whole, we can place the geometry modifiers. Now, the first thing this is going to do is we've placed some brown decals down to show that the terrain has changed and we've actually modified the terrain to show the path of the river. As you can see, if I just turn these off, as you can see, we've got a deep trench where the river is flowing and then banks around the river. But usually rivers have water, so let's add in some water. Now, obviously, this is work in progress. This is just using the sea mesh but it just to prove the concept that we can have water in the basis of our rivers. But it still doesn't look quite right. If you look at a river in the wild going through any ecosystem, whether it be a forest or some fields or a desert, you'll notice that the terrain around it is different and that's because the water influences the ecosystem. We get more vegetation and growth around places where there are water. So in order to make this look as convincing as possible, we're going to experiment with adding more foliage and more ecosystem changes around the rivers. So this is just a programmer's take on this. No artists have had any say in what I'm doing here. So by borrowing a slightly more lush preset from a different planet, we can see that we can create this really effective look around the rivers with far more trees and ground cover just to really sell the idea that this is a river that has been here for thousands of years and is flowing through the hills of Microtech. So now that we've added in this ecosystem around the river, it really sells and looks like a river flowing through the hills of Microtech. This looks And then he does all this, and then we get a little preview of what it looks like in engine. Not a finished product, and these are the all player. engineer art choices rather than artist art choices. I can imagine someone screaming at me for the fact that we've got some beautiful kind of tropical trees here versus some snowy pines in the backdrop. But the fact that we can modify the ecosystem around these rivers means that we're going to be able to create some really convincing looking ecosystems. So this was the first look we got at rivers. This was in 2021. Um, but then, you know, he built it and he kept working on it and he iterated on it until the point where it could just do it for him planet wide, which I, I freaking sick. So when I'm happy with my settings, I will click gather river proposals and the computer will take a moment over finding some river proposals for us. As this is happening, you can see red circles appearing on the planet. They are all of the proposal positions that fulfill the criteria we've put so far. So they're in the correct biome and they have the correct number of macro steps or more. It's told me that it's found 25 potential river positions, which is awesome. So the next step is to filter them. Currently, what filtering does is it makes sure that the river isn't going to flow through an outpost. 
it checks that the river is valid and that the water is actually flowing along the line that the prediction thought it would. And it checks that it's another minimum length. In this case, it's 40 node steps. So I'll click filter and we'll wait for the computer to do that for me. During this process, we can see that some of the red circles will start to disappear as they're discarded if they've not met the filter criteria. Right, in the end, it's actually only found four valid river positions, which is fine because I put in some pretty stringent criteria. So at this point, I'm going to click Create Rivers. This is going to actually place the rivers into the world, and we know that they're already going to match a certain length and other criteria that we've put in. Now that we've got four new created rivers, the next step will be to commit all of them. But actually, I'm going to hesitate slightly. I'm going to go across to the Rivers tab, and I'm going to filter to rivers that are uncommitted. So this is showing me all four rivers that have not been committed yet, which means that they are on the planet and they are present, but they haven't been saved to data. Uh, and I'm going to go to each of them and commit them manually. So first, uh, let's sort by length. So we'll start off with our shortest river. And this is something hopefully they can automate, you know, so you could just click a button and it does this for rivers, for caves, for outposts, for unique land masses and uh, makes planets easier to make, I hope. And looks a little better to me. Uh, I think I'm going to let this one stay. Go to the next river. Yep, very happy. 11 kilometers long. So, got a good length on that one. And this one is 12 kilometers long. And again, looks very similar. So yeah, of these four rivers, I'm happy with three of them, and I'm going to let them all stay. Going forward, I'm going to uh, allow artists to specify a minimum final length in kilometers rather than just nodes. And one of the big things that I'm going to do next is spring points. What this is, is artists will be able to add hint positions at various points in the height maps to say a river would look good starting here. For example, a crevice or a crack in a mountainous height map. And that's just going to mean that the quality of our automatically placed rivers is just going to be a step higher because the start is always going to look somewhere natural rather than just starting anywhere in the middle of a field. Because at the moment it is largely random positions that it's trying and then filtering from there. So that's what I've been up to with the river stuff recently. In between fixing bugs for patches and stuff, I'm really happy with the progress I've been able to make on this, and it's really cool being able to show it off again. Uh, hopefully, we will be having a lot more rivers on a lot more planets coming to the verse very soon. Thank you, Water Guy Will. River Guy. This is not the last we'll see of him either. He, he comes up quite a bit. All right, so... Our next stop is actually looking at the planets of Pyro. So we've, we, we did a lot of looking at planets coming to Stanton and how they looked in terms of ground, ground scattering and resources and all that jazz. This is kind of a look at what they created when they started from scratch with Planet Tech V4 on a new system that wasn't as terrestrial. So we'll, I'll just give you a couple of looks at each of the different planets that they show here. This is from 2022. look a bit nicer and then interesting thing to highlight here plants over there so what's interesting about those is we made them like three or four years ago um, they were supposed to be a uh, part of like a mission in uh, on a space station the mission was scrapped um, unfortunately um, and ever since then, the, this asset set has just been sitting in our like vault. Uh, it's a really cool plant set, and I'm happy that we finally found uh, a spot to use them. So this is another spot I want to highlight. Um, it's also important for us that we do add something memorable to each planet. Um, in the case of Pyro 1, it's this spiky rock set that looks really intimidating. We try to push the scale of the assets for the pyro system. We felt like by now we got like the, the basic rocks and the scattering of the basic rocks to like a very good quality. So now we can explore more crazy shapes, I guess. And this is one of the sets that we made. 
Um, it's not done yet, it still needs a polish pass, but I wanted to show you guys what it feels like when you're in-game walking around here. Now I want to show you my personal favorite biome of Pyro 1. It's this biome here, Pancake rocks. which has these really cool looking rock formations. They are massive in scale, like if I jump in-game here, you get a good feeling for the scale of them. Yeah, it's possible to land your spaceship on them. Um, it's probably really fun to yeah, race through here. We can imagine that this is gonna be like a nice combat space as well because they do provide nice, nice cover. Let's just jump to a couple different areas on Pyro 1 before we move to Pyro 2. So now we're on Pyro 2. Um, in comparison to Pyro 1, you can immediately see the planet is like way more colorful. There's more variation in uh, the use and values of the colors. Um, we have like browns and um, like bone white spots, some red, uh, and it's all contrasted by like a blue clear ocean. So Pyro 2 doesn't have volumetric clouds yet, but they will be there at release. So now I jump to um, one of the biomes of Pyro 2. What I want to highlight here is the improvements that we made to how assets spawn on the side of mountains. That was something that was always quite challenging for us to do, to have some natural transition from the terrain to the geometry, and then also have like the rocks form in a natural way. Um, now, we can make nicer rock formations. It's not quite there yet. Um, there are still improvements planned for it, but I think in comparison to what we had before, um, this is a big step forward. Also, what you might see is the drawing distance. It's got like Southwest distance, vibes, yeah? Greatly improved. So everything you see here in the distance is actual geometry. So if we were to fly all the way over there, you, would, you will see that this is um, yeah, like cliff formations. And I think it looks really cool, like the, the silhouette of the terrain. Yeah, let's fly through the canyons. Yeah, I would do this in a spaceship, but I'm horrible at flying. <laughs> so I'm just gonna use uh, the camera in editor. Cheater. So now I jumped ahead to a really cool biome on Pyro 2. Um, it's simple, but I think sometimes less is more. Uh, in this case, what sets this biome apart from the rest of the planet is that we added these calcified trees um, and they spawn in very dense clusters um, so you almost get like little forests of them so it's all right here's some pyro 3 which we've seen the most 3. of i think um, so from this distance you can see through the volumetric clouds like a lot of the yellow coming through we talked about what's making it look yellow which is the moss and i want to like jump down to the planet surface and show you the amount of detail that you will see when uh, going up close to the moss. So we're down at the surface now. I'm just gonna jump in game. A lot of time and effort was spent on making the moss look just right. So like the right level of fluffiness um, and density. Fluff. It looks really nice when it like covers these rocks. Um, and then we also- Every game needs some good fluff. Smaller moss on the ground. Um, we combine it with like yellow grass uh, and it makes for like a really interesting biome. So it was really important for us to make this biome look really dense. Um, so we pushed the amount of assets that we're using. So it's basically completely covered in foliage. Compared to Hurston, for example, which, yeah, Pyro 3 is beautiful. which are probably our densest planets when it comes to foliage, um, this is way denser. Um, the good thing is that we don't have any trees here, so all the budget we can use on ground cover, on grass. Now we jump to a pyro coast biome. The improvements we got to the coast biomes is that we can now use a OPR override for every single biome. Previously, we could only use one global override per planet, 
which as you can imagine is not enough when you have something like Stanton 4 where you have snowy regions and the uh, spruce tree regions and one object preset just can't cover every coast. We added these coral, um, this, like coral geology set um, to have some of the yellow also along the coast. Um, so you see here, we always have like a little just bit of yellow. Just to remind you, we're yellow, we're yellow out here. All right, pyrophoric things get a little interesting. Yeah, just full disclosure, you can probably tell that the clouds here are not done yet. They do look a bit busted, but yeah, they will be, they will look amazing once the planet comes out. So let's focus on the terrain shapes. We created some of these terrain shapes special for Pyro 4 because it's loosely inspired by like Scottish highlands. Um, so there's not a lot of like verticality, uh, not a lot of trees. So everything is kind of coming from the terrain and from the smaller assets that we scatter on the terrain geometry. So jumping in game, and then you can see the amount. I of really like the vibes of this planet on display, um, the variation in color, but it's all grounded by like the, the color of the soil. Um, and it just looks like we have multiple new vegetation sets on display here. So first of all, we have this um, bush set here, which is called, um, I think it's called a fire stalk which, yeah, it's kind of like a modified version of the real world thing. They add like a little bit of color to the area um, and make things pop. Then. Mohammed, can you please explain what you're talking about in YouTube so I don't think you're just spamming the word ultras over and over? Thank you. We have these ones here. I forgot the name of the asset set. Yeah, they also look quite saturated um, and interesting. We also try to improve the quality of our tree sets. If you if you compare like the trees that we have on Hurston to like the red grass and it kind of feathers out. Yeah, it feels very organic and natural. Let's jump to the most experimental biome that we've made so far. So for this biome here, the concept art team gave us this is Pyro um, 3. some really interesting concept art because this is easily some of the the biggest uh, rock formations that we have in the game so far. Actually, let me try to fly a ship so you can see the city's bad at flying. So them. hold on. So they're massive in scale. And what was the hardest part? There's going to be racetracks, no these, doubt, on this planet going uh, through these arches. The right is that they're supposed to look really good from a distance um, because you would expect something this big. Um, yeah, to be visible almost from space. Um, but then the tricky thing is also to make them look good um, when you're standing up close to them. Let me jump in game so you see how big these rocks actually are. So they are massive in scale. Um, you can probably land your spaceship on them and walk on them and they make you feel like really small. But I think it's, it's a really good visual that you have these like dark gray rocks against the, the crimson of the soil and the grass. So here's a little happy accident where we have the volumetric clouds uh, covering the terrain. And because the, the height map, the, the difference in height um, is so large, we actually get like shapes of the terrain poking out of the volumetric clouds. Okay, can yeah, I just can say, if, the if they fix that happy little accident, I will be pissed because it's beautiful having the fog like that. Technologies from, are you just calling CIG Ultra? Is that it? The tiling issues that we have here, uh, which is something that we still need to look at. But like I said before, uh, this is still work in progress. Um, so it's going to change a bit. Because I mentioned biome diversity along the coasts before, uh, I just wanted to highlight what one of the coast biomes on Pyro 4 looks like. So this one is kind of this wet sand. Um, we scattered some of the seaweed, some of these um, yeah, lava plates uh, and some of these pebbles. And then we also get like nice seaweed uh, moving with the waves of the ocean. One interesting thing on Pyro 4 is that we have a massive crater region. On other planets, we have 
individual craters which are a whole height map or like three, four smaller craters on one height map. But this is actually multiple height maps forming one large crater. Um, and you can see it all the way out in space. Like this whole region is one big crater. So it's a mix of like the global displacement. Uh, there better be unique mineables in this crater, you know? Height maps of the ecosystems um, spawning on top. Plus the volumetric clouds uh, make it look really epic here. Now we've flown down to the surface of the crater. Um, we wanted this to feel very, yes, yeah, sp spooky and grim and kind of dark. So we have these um, dark fantasy forest looking trees, uh, yeah, which look kind of creepy. Uh, then we bring some of the red grass back from the previous um, biome. We go down to the surface of the crater you can see that we added this dark forest looking tree set some creepy shapes um, some moist looking ground cover assets. moist rocks and this whole area is supposed to make you feel a bit uneasy all right on to i believe this is a moon of pyro 5. this one is pyro 5c Similar to Pyro 4, you can see that it has a landmark that you can see from space. In this Yo, me, hi, thank you so much for gifting out five subs on Twitch. You are the homie. Makes a big difference to us. I really appreciate you. Thank you for getting us almost to our goal for the day. Much love, my friend. It's not a crater, but it's like, yeah, like a long streak of um, slick obsidian. So let's fly down to the surface of the streak and have a look what it looks like from up close. Again, uh, we start with like the global height map where um, there's, there's like a, a little bit of a bump up and then it goes down to form um, the crack. And then we scatter um, the ecosystem uh, height maps on top to get the look that we want. So if we go down here, you can see we start with like flatland shapes, some smaller craters, and then uh, it transitions into like these quite spiky looking uh, rock formation, uh, mountain formations. And then down here, they feather into like these longer ridges of bedrock before it becomes smooth down here. And if we jump to this point, which is a really cool spot because like the sun just hits the obsidian in the right way and everything looks like nice and shiny. Um, you can see here that the ground looks quite different from other planets. So instead of soil, it's, it's yeah, it, it almost looks artificial in a way. Asset wise, we're using one of our obsidian sets that you can also find on Stanton 4. Um, this one got a bit of an update, a bit of polish, uh, so we improved the shapes, uh, different textures, just to make it look extra cool. Like the way the sunlight uh, hits um, these surfaces. To make this area a bit more interesting, we decided to add some of these. And then from there we have Pyro 6, which is like a dusty rock, really. Then over here, I want to... It looks a little bit like Walla to me. A little less atmosphere. Right now, just to show you what it feels like walking along like chalky. here. Um, you can see that we added some dramatic looking uh, coral shapes. And then eventually but ultimately, I'll give you guys a look at the sizzle reel they have for all of these planets. You'll see Pyro 1, 2, 3, 4, 5C, which is the moon of 5, and then 6. And I believe they show just a quick look at the gas giant, which is Pyro 5. Good vibes you were asking about. So check this out. Even more excited than before after seeing what I showed you today. So this is Pyro 1. Pyro 2.
Pyro 3. Pyro 4. This is Pyro 5C. And Pyro 6. And to be honest, I don't think these are like crazy spectacularly different than what we've seen so far, but it's clear that they're starting to branch out a little bit more, and I hope they continue to do so. That pyro skybox, though. Here is uh, water effects that we've seen as Will the Water Guy returns to show us more of what he was doing with water, and then we will look at the future of planets briefly. Before we wrap things up, accurate is any of our work going forward. And here's a really good video of some of it in action. Just I'll let that play. This is the debug mode. Essentially, we're moving a sphere of basically infinite mass through the water. And as you see, if we pan out a bit, we make our sphere a bit bigger, we get a much different result from the sim. Spawning the foam properly. It looks really nice. Really happy with this one. So what I'm going to do in a second is I'm going to turn on the, the debug mode so you can see where the regions are. You see we've got these gray boxes. They light up green when there is a hit inside the box. We've also got different sizes going on. If you look near the shore there, there's a big cluster of text. That is a whole bunch of other regions because there's some stuff floating there causing little ripples that we can't actually see. And as you see, these scale properly. We can add the results from multiple sizes of simulation together and they influence and interact with one another accurately. You see those big waves crashing over the little sim there. It, yeah, it, it works pretty nicely. <laughs> it just I've works. I've ahead of my subtitles, but I'll just let that video play out. So, what does that look like when we bring it all together? What's it going to look like in game? Now, you did see a little bit of this in the Star Engine trailer, but actually, I think this video does a little bit more justice to it. So, I'm just going to let that play out for you. in a second, you're going to see the wake start to happen behind us there. And from the cockpit perspective, water droplets on the glass thrown up from the water sim. This is what I'm talking about using multi-output. And that's us. Thank you so much, Sitcon. Handing back over to Ali. Okay, so from here, water's looking good, of course. There's a lot of stuff they talk about here, uh, dynamic range. This is, this is a, an engine demo, so it's not just about Planet Tech. They talk about dynamic range, temporal upscaling, which they have included into the game at this point. A lot of the stuff they've talked about at CitizenCon last year is already in the game, which is better than they usually do. Um, now here's the talk. This is kind of the, the wrap up overall of this whole talk. And point being, at this point, they have developed this tech out quite a bit to where they're ready to start building new star systems. And they get a little bit into the details here of how they want to do that, because obviously they don't want to do the same thing they've been doing over these last couple of hours of what we've been watching to build 
systems. They want to be able to have planets kind of do this on their own more quickly. So here is a good like four minute, three to four minute talk of the future of this and how they're going to develop this stuff a little bit faster. When we get the screen space shadows, you look in the, the top of the screen or in the, uh, the flowers, they type of fill in the detail for the rest. They really help type of bed the scene in and stop these things looking at floating. Next up, I just want to talk about planets for a little bit. Uh, it's something I get asked about a lot of what's happening next with planets. So we've got quite a lot of R&D in progress. First thing, we've got two new uh, pieces of tech being started recently. First is virtual terrain texturing. Uh, it's quite a technical detail, but what this means for you is we're hopefully going to get much less popping or no popping at all. And we're going to achieve this by moving all the calculations to the GPU. And Somebody we'll was talking about that towards the beginning of this stream, that, that popping was something that they did not like. I don't like it either. It happens a lot. So moving this stuff to GPU hopefully does take care of that. You, we're using the same type of uh, patch-based system that Will talked about in his water presentation. And it should give you major CPU savings as well. So we're quite looking forward to getting this in. Another benefit is that it's going to give us the ability to add more complicated logic on so we can type of do more diverse and interesting terrain, like things like, you know, we don't have beaches at the moment, we'll be able to achieve that. And there's other similar things where, based on the local conditions, we're able to do more advanced decision making. Next thing we want to look at, which is probably the thing we asked about the most, is our scattering system, which is what we're responsible for putting all the trees and the rocks down in the world. Um, we're going to, again, move this to 100% to the GPU, and that should let us have vastly longer draw distances uh, right up until the horizon and much better performance. Uh, so we'll finally get rid of the dreaded pop of trees coming in for you. Um, we also have to integrate it with our harvestable system, the resource system, and the, the awesome fire system you just saw a minute ago. Um, Another point is it's going to be a hierarchical Far Cry system, 2 fires. What that means is we'll be able to use nearby vegetational rocks to influence what other vegetation rocks can grow or will show up. And this lets us produce much more complicated rule sets so we can do things like have a tree that maybe underneath it, it's, it doesn't have any grass or maybe certain trees come together in clumps. And we'll get a much more natural distribution of vegetation. And final thing we want for planets is we want to be able to build them much easier, much faster, and we want to make sure they are truly unique. At the moment, our planets are unique. However, they are built from type of tile sets, like pre-built things that get mixed and matched together and blended in complicated ways so that you don't see the repetition. But it's not truly unique, not in the same way that the Grand Canyon might be, or the River Nile, or Mount Everest. And that's what we want. So to get that, we need to replicate the complicated natural processes on Earth, like geology, climate erosion. And these things aren't trivial. So we've got three options. We've got offline tools, Houdini, Terragen, things like this. We could simulate all these processes in the engine. But we've started some R&D a few months ago on uh, the whether we can use machine learning to do some of this. So just to give you a quick idea of how that would work or how it could work, if you just start with some random input here, it's just like some noise. Uh, we run it through a, a temporary, simulation, temporary simulation, so we can type of get a more uh, reasonable uh, approximation of simulation at different altitudes uh, and latitudes on Earth. Um, and then we, he we skips over this stuff so fast, but I think it's interesting that this temperature simulation will take into account the distance from the star and the planet's freaking inclination. So, like, if you're tipped on your side, like Earth develops differently than if a planet just has a flat spin, which I think is really cool different altitudes uh, and latitudes on Earth. Um, and then we, what we do is we categorize all this into different biomes. So based on the temperature and moisture, you'd find out what is a desert, what is a forest. And this, this part is crucial. So this is the input for our machine learning algorithm. We could come up with this image any other way. You could hand paint it as an artist, or we could just randomize the noise to get a different set of images. And then what we do is we take the large data sets we already have from Earth, from Mars, and from the Moon and we train it on exactly the same uh, distribution, uh, so biomes, so forests, uh, grasslands, and things like this. And by training I, I, it on I feel exactly like now that they've discovered so many more exoplanets because of uh, the James Webb scope, I'm wondering if they can use more than just Earth, Moon, and Mars to train this machine learning stuff, because we're starting to be able to see a lot more planetary surfaces in our own galaxy now. The type of data we get in reality, we can take this and then push just that, and then we can get these lovely height maps out of it that tell us a really realistic distribution. You can see here, this is a height map, so the black areas are low. Can we not see, see any surfaces? And valleys. And Dang. This had zero R input, aside from this image, which is a very nice result. Um, 
it's early days. Uh, it, this is based on something called a custom diffusion neural network. Um, it's, like I said, it's pre-trained on Earth data, and it's been built up in patches so that it just doesn't become too expensive to build. And the little circular patches get like, added together and they, to avoid all, any seams in the image. And then just to help you visualize it, I've just put some colorization on it to show you where like, snow and betas might be, and just wrapped it around a planet to give you a better sense so it doesn't look quite so abstract. Yeah, but this is very early days, this stuff, but we're hopeful this will be helping the future of how we build planets quickly and efficiently. Um, thank you. It's pretty cool stuff. I do hope that we could at least use information from planets in our system, like, I don't know, ones that aren't super cloudy, but perhaps not. Either way, it's cool that they can start to use real life data to influence how these things are formed and build some more believable and interesting and unique planets. Um, but that's, you know, it's very short what they talked about here on the future of planets. I think they'll get it more into this in CitizenCon this year. And Planet Tech V5 is supposed to be something that they're covering more towards the end of the year and leading up to Alpha 4.0, or I think actually after Alpha 4.0. So we'll see more of that later. But that about wraps everything I had planned to talk to you guys about with planets. We went, we went, we went well into our time today. I'm not, I mean, I've done enough talking throughout this whole thing, so I'm not going to leave you with any sort of summary, but I hope you got some new information from this, learned something about how these planets are made. Uh, maybe that can, you know, you can spread the news. Let folks know when they ask about these planet stuff. This is what, this is the whole story they went through. It's a long freaking process from all the way back here with like the... <laughs> God, going through all that and then looking at this moon surface is very funny. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really interesting look. This is, I think, one of the most consistently improving parts of Star Citizen. Arguably, one of the best things they do is build planets. I think ships, obviously, is very good. They do a good job with that. But planets are not the focus of the game, yet they have done an amazing job of improving them, I think. There's still plenty of problems with like tiling and repetition. We don't have dynamic weather. We don't have dynamic clouds. Uh, if we go to life in the verse from 2021, you will see kind of their goal for the clouds and the weather system, which is beautiful, but they don't quite have that yet. Um, ultimately, I think this is where they want to be. Talking about the planet. And I hope they get there soon. But there's still plenty of things they got to work on to get these planets up to truly, you know, the masterful look I think they're looking for. But I think they are, if not leading the industry, they're up there. You know, top top three different developers and publishers who are working on various planets in their games. This is definitely helping to set the bar. And I can't wait to see what they do. Now that they've got more developers in here and... Uh, they're building more tools to actually build systems rather than just the tech that's building the planets. Here's a quick look at what I think is their kind of goal for clouds and weather, at least. Well, very cold. Uh, as you can see, some of those lightning strikes in the clouds, but, uh, but yeah, very, very pretty looking. So this is uh, the first time we're actually seeing clouds above uh, a terrestrial planet. You know, we went through quite a few iterations of uh, forms. Uh, what we ultimately ended upon was something that felt quite, uh, uh, quite dramatic. Uh, still believable in terms of uh, how the wind would have shaped them, um, but yeah, like uh, it's showcasing a lot of the the, the more recent um, tech uh, that came online. Uh, also, what we're seeing here is like some kind of distant thunder strikes. And what this is, it's uh, kind of like a prelude to, you know, future uh, weather features that we come on board, you know, and how this will tie into, you know, uh, storms and uh, ship handling, you know, due to the turbulence. And it's great seeing the... Uh, they actually did mention in the monthly report, I couldn't find it last time we were streaming, but one of the monthly reports, they mentioned that they're working on the ability for lightning to strike ship shields and how that would reflect on the shields, which is pretty cool. Yeah, the, I, you know... I know that the, the James Webb scope and the Hubble scope and all the places that we've discovered exoplanets are kind of based on the wavelengths and the way that the light transmits through the atmospheres and stuff. I was really hoping that we would get more defined because that's super far away. Like that's kind of ridiculous to expect actual looks at the, the surface of planets, but hopefully we can study the planets in our own system more and get data that can be used for this kind of stuff. Either way, 
Earth is plenty. Earth has a lot of really cool stuff going on. So if we could trade it on Earth's terrain, uh, you know, I'm sure that's a big step up from artificially making it as they have been doing now. So I, I can't wait to see what they do with the future of all this stuff. And hopefully at some point we make a, a super a super telescope so that we can see other planets or other things in other systems. You can't expect that? I can f***ing expect that, all right? <laughs> um, I appreciate you guys all being here. Thank you for watching.